Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Planning Commission review session for Monday, May 3rd, 2021. The time is 1 p.m. and a quorum is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a referral of a citywide text amendment. Our presenters are Jennifer Gravel and Alex Plakis. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Jen Gravel, Director of Housing and Economic Development. I wanna thank you for your time today. I'm joined by my colleagues, Alex Plakis, the Project Manager, and Howard Slatkin, the Deputy Executive Director of Strategic Planning. And we're here to share a proposal for the citywide hotel special permit. The desire for better review of hotel development has been part of the public discourse on land use and planning for well over a decade, spanning two mayoral administrations. Since 2010, the CPC has adopted special permits for new hotels as part of special districts and area-wide rezonings in response to concerns about hotel development. In 2018, the CPC adopted a special permit for new hotels and light manufacturing districts to address conflicts with businesses. And more recently, the administration announced its intention to create a new special permit for new hotels citywide, and the department was prepared to move ahead with the proposal prior to the pandemic. You have no doubt frequently heard the department speak about how important as a right development and use flexibility are to the city's capacity to provide enough housing and space for a wide range of uses to meet its needs. Indeed, requiring projects to go through Euler will inevitably result in some reduction in the number of projects that are built. At the same time, certain uses in zoning do require special permits and requiring discussionary review for use involves a trade-off between the benefits of reviewing individual projects and the potential for less space to be supplied or supplied less quickly. The proposal suggests that unique characteristics of transient accommodations, which have some characteristics of residential use and some of commercial use, warrant review of individual projects in a way that would not be necessary or appropriate for other uses. Although this proposal was delayed because of the impact of the pandemic on the city's tourism industry, visitation is now projected to recover and grow. While it is important that, the ho that hotels can continue to locate throughout the city to support a vibrant tourism economy and meet the diverse needs of its residents and businesses, the pre-pandemic pace and patterns of development driven by record high visitation are likely to return which is why we are advancing this proposal now. However, we realize the importance of supporting a rapid recovery and that the constraints, of new development, constraints on new development that would be imposed by a new special permit need to allow for that recovery. Therefore, the proposal we are sharing today differs from what the department was contemplating just 18 months ago and now includes specific provisions that support that recovery and are expected to allow for the hotel inventory to return to pre-pandemic levels. We are confident that the city will remain committed to meeting its goals to support long-term growth and recovery of the tourism industry, and the industry can adapt to better review of new development. The proposal involves a trade-off between the burden of additional review and the benefits of evaluating individual projects for the specific use. The public review process enables evaluation of this trade-off, and we are proud of the work the department has done to prepare and assess a thoughtful proposal to inform decision makers in public discussion. And I'd now like to, to give the floor to the project manager, Alex Plakis, to share details of what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, this project is a zoning text amendment that created a new special permit for hotel development across the city. The goal is to create a consistent framework for hotel development and ensure that new hotels do not negatively affect the surrounding area. Next slide, please. So by 2019, before the pandemic hit, New York City experienced record growth in the tourism industry and its hotel pipeline for the 10th consecutive year. Visitor trends peaked in 2019 with almost 67 million visitors, up from 46 million in 2009. Visitor count was forecasted to increase even more in 2020 to almost 69 million. Furthermore, sizable growth of the hotel room supply has been a prevailing factor in New York City for much of the past decade. Between 2009 and 2019, the total number of hotel rooms in the New York City market grew from just over 80,000 
to over 127,000, an increase of almost 40% in the past five years alone. Despite this increase in hotel room supply, demand also continued to rise, keeping annual occupancy at almost 87%, and occupancy rates in New York City are among the highest for urban markets in the United States. The growth of the New York City market of the last decade was driven by both international and domestic travelers, and these visitors are coming to New York City for its cultural offerings, with shopping and sightseeing being the principal reasons for about 86% of international visitors. Next slide, please. So over the years, uh, rapid growth of new hotels across different districts in the city has led to concerns about conflicts with surrounding uses. Notably, in 2018, a special permit was adopted for hotels in M1 districts to address conflicts between hotels and the operations of industrial businesses. Next slide, please. To address these concerns, the City Planning Commission has adopted a variety of special permits relating to hotel development in these special districts seen here. And this has resulted in an inconsistent framework for regulating hotels throughout the city. Next slide, please. And as we can see on the map here, hotel development has occurred throughout the city. And in C and MX districts, hotels have introduced conflicts with surrounding uses. Uh, as previously mentioned by Jen, overnight accommodations differ from others as of right uses in proximity because they are similar to both commercial and residential uses, but also have the, the potential to conflict with both. This unique distinction of hotels may require additional scrutiny to ensure they are developed in ways that won't present conflicts with the neighborhood and local businesses. A robust tourism economy is vital to the city's economic health and is expected to recover from the pandemic. Once the industry recovers from the pandemic, hotel development is expected to resume Patterns of hotel development over the last 15 years still indicate a need to ensure that hotel development does not create conflicts with surrounding uses. Thus, the proposed tax amendment will create a consistent zoning framework for new hotels and allow the City Planning Commission to evaluate each hotel development's impact on the future use and development of the surrounding area. Next slide, please. Hotels have the potential to create land use conflicts in a variety of neighborhood contexts and zoning districts. For example, we are already aware of the potential conflicts hotels can have in light manufacturing or M1 districts. And several C districts in the city also have hotels in areas where it can be in conflict with nearby businesses or the site may be planned in a way that may be unsafe for guests and residents. The hotel in the C62 district is an example where the hotel is set back from the street creating a less than ideal pedestrian environment. And as we can see in the bottom right, uh, the hotel, which is located in the Rockaways, is a hotel where better site planning may have led to a wider sidewalk. The current sidewalk leading to the beach is thin and may push pedestrians into the street, causing safety concerns for guests and residents alike. Similarly, the hotel in the top right, C43A district, forces vehicles to drive over the sidewalk through a curb cut, which um, may present conflicts with pedestrians. The hotel in the C8 district is located across the street from the cemetery and is surrounded by heavy commercial uses, which may not be an ideal location as well. Next slide, please. The new special permit will be applicable in higher density commercial districts, mixed use districts, and paired M1R districts, where there is not a special permit today. And the new special permit will apply to those areas that already have a special permit that appear in gray on the map here. M1 districts will retain the findings from the M1 hotel special permit, since those address unique concerns in light industrial areas. Next slide, please. Similar to M1, we will not require a special permit for facilities that are used for a public purpose, such as temporary housing for the homeless. This means that rules for siting of homeless facilities 
will not change and will continue to be permitted as of right in districts they are currently allowed today. While we understand the concerns, the proposal is intended to address the land use concerns related to commercial hotels and is neutral with current policies regarding homelessness. Next slide, please. New York City's hotels provide an important amenity for all New Yorkers, and for this reason, have long been permitted with limited regulation in districts with varied land use context in much of the city. Hotels serve a diverse set of customers in all five boroughs, from international tourists in Midtown, airline workers in Jamaica, clients of film studios in Astoria and Long Island City, visitors coming for the city's medical institutions, and relatives visiting with friends or family living in any of New York City's neighborhoods. While it's important that hotels can continue to locate throughout the city to support a vibrant tourism economy and meet the diverse needs of its residents and businesses, the pace and patterns of development driven by record high visitation has created conflicts with adjacent uses and overwhelmed some communities. For example, the images shown here are of the front and back of a hotel located in the South Bronx. It is located uh, near New Yankee Stadium and is an appropriate location for a hotel. However, access to the hotel is on a busy access road on the Major Deegan with an entrance that presents potential safety issues for pedestrians and guests in the hotel. The parking and back of house services at the rear of the hotel are located on a quiet residential block. Review of the way the use is configured on the site would likely have resulted in a development that is more sensitive to the surrounding context and less likely to create conflicts of safety issues for guests and adjacent uses. It is also important to note the proposed special permit does not preclude hotel development, nor does it deem all future hotels inappropriate. It requires the City Planning Commission to assess the appropriateness of such development based on the future use and development of the local surrounding area. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to briefly talk about the recent impacts of the pandemic on the hotel industry and ways that we have modified the proposal to try to address these concerns. The COVID pandemic has had a significant effect on the New York City hotel market. Between January and November of 2020, a net total of 146 hotels out of 705 and over 42,000 rooms have closed. Luxury and upscale rooms have accounted for almost 85% of this loss. Estimates by the city's independent budget office placed job losses in the hospitality and leisure industry at around 197,000 jobs in 2020. COVID has had an impact on the hotel industry, but there's optimism that the city will recover and visitors will return with many experts placing this recovery in 2025. With that return in demand, the Department of City Planning anticipates development to return to pre-pandemic levels, leading to a need for the special permit, allowing for better regulation. However, we do not want these regulations to prevent recovery in the city. Next slide, please. Because of these significant impacts that the pandemic is having on the hotel industry, we've created several provisions to minimize the likelihood that the special permit will impair the recovery of the hotel industry. These include a modified vesting provision to facilitate projects that are already in the pipeline, even if foundations are not complete by adoption. Aging projects filed with the Department of Buildings prior to 2018 need to obtain a foundation permit prior to adoption. Projects filed between January 1st of 2018 and referral need to obtain zoning plan approval from DOB prior to adoption. And both categories of vested projects will have six years from date of adoption to complete, the, uh, to complete construction instead of the standard two years. Approved CPC or Board of Standards and Appeals applications will not require a special permit if these applications were approved after January 1st of 2018. And applications that begin CPC public review or are filed with BSA prior to adoption will not require a special permit. 
Finally, there is an extended discontinuous provision allowing for vacant hotels extra time to return to transient use. Usual discontinuance allows for a building that has been vacant for two years to reopen with its previous use. We are proposing an extension to six years to allow for closed hotels to reopen. These provisions are meant to allow for a portion of the 42,000 rooms to return, bringing back an important industry to New York City. Next slide, please. A draft environmental impact statement and market study were done to understand what the projected loss in rooms would mean for the hotel and tourism industries. Findings in the study and the DEIS show we expect sufficient inventory by 2030 to support the amount of pre-pandemic visitors, which is a robust tourism and economy. However, because of the special permit being expected to slow the growth of new hotels, it is expected that there would not be enough rooms to meet demand of the no action in 2035, leading to a shortfall of approximately 47,000 rooms. Because of the future shortfall of rooms and potential effects on visitation, the DEIS is showing a significant adverse impact on the hotel and tourism industries. However, we expect that as this visitation recovers, the concerns that have been raised with respect to hotel development over the last 15 years will once again rise again, focusing attention on the subject of the proposal and the regulation of how and where hotels are built. Next slide, please. This slide shows the zoning text and findings that will be, that will be used when a hotel applies for a special permit. And that's the end of this presentation. If there are any questions, we are happy to answer them. Thank you, Alex. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Cirillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank the staff for their, for their presentation. So I guess I'll, first of all, I'll, I'll start with what the, what, what, what seems hopeful and helpful. And that's the, the provisions regarding sort of, I'll call them the recovery provisions. I, I think they are sort of quite thoughtful and necessary. Um, and I think address many of the challenges the industry is certainly dealing with uh, still uh, at this time. Um, I guess the, the one thing I would add in, in my, my comment on that is that the, those provisions should move ahead regardless of this sort of bigger picture issue that kind of turns it into an entirely different proposal. But I, I do want to acknowledge the addition of those provisions in, in this sort of post COVID and what will be a continued uh, you know, recovery from, from this past year. Um, uh, so I, I, that's just one, one thought. Um, I guess, you know, the, I guess there were questions within the thoughts and this is, um, you know, this, it's not the first time that we're sort of discussing this issue, but I, I kind of feel um, that really what, what, really needs to be understood because obviously the presentation is developed and rightfully to support the application um, and the proposal. But I guess the real underlying question is, while we know what the proposal does based on the, and the or what the proposal attempts to do, it's really not clear why we're dealing with the proposal at all at this time but for the recovery provisions, which I'll separate. Um, so I guess, you know, when we did the special permit in the M zones, we, we did them because there was a particular purpose in dealing with the M zones, even though that too was, I don't want to say controversial, but certainly debatable, even, even that. Um, so what what is what has happened in this period of time from that last proposal to now to say we really need to deal with this on this broad based scale 
especially at this time, that should help convince the public or us as a commission that this is the direction we should be moving in right now versus just trying to deal with recovery. Um, and I guess the, and, okay, I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. And we, we share the concerns that you've expressed about the effect of the pandemic on the hotel and tourism industries, and which is why we were trying to be very thoughtful in terms of the provisions that we prepare to help with the recovery. And, and the intention of that and the provisions are drafted really with the intention of bringing the inventory back to a place where it existed before the pandemic. Um, you know, and the, you know, the truth is we plan for the future of the city and we do believe that the industry will recover. We're optimistic and we, we are champions of the city and we believe that's gonna happen. And we also continue to support the tourism sector and know that it's vital to the city's economic health. So, however, the, the patterns of development over the years have led to calls for greater review of hotel development within a variety of varied context neighborhoods with which they are allowed. And we expect that when that um, when the, the recovery rebounds, that the, the development that was leading to these calls will come back as well. Um, and uh, so this idea has been in the, in the public process for a while. And, we are committed now that, that we have a proposal that we think thoughtfully addresses the concern to, to thoughtfully addresses the concerns raised by the pandemic, that it's time to, to put this into the process and evaluate the trade-offs between these bur the burden um, that, that this additional re will require and, and the uh, concerns that existed prior to the pandemic related to the, related to the patterns and pace of hotel growth. And, and, and it is, <clears throat> the administration's position that this has to happen now in while we're still in the middle of the pandemic and begging people to return to our city versus perhaps following the process of recovery for some time to figure out really where we're headed, which of course is a mystery, although we all obviously remain hopeful. Um, but I mean, even, even I guess today, and I think it was cited in the, in the presentation, I guess it was by Alexander that, that you know, perhaps it's 2025, which is four years from now. Um, I know the, the New York Times in, in, a, in a story just last week talked about you know, um, a fiscal impact of 350 million to upwards of $7 billion, perhaps over the next 10 or more years. And I just, it's, you know, I, I, again, as, as much as the provisions attempt to protect neighborhoods, which I, from, from sort of change that, may not be welcomed in all neighborhoods or in character with all neighborhoods. There's just sort of the bigger policy and land use issues that just feel like they're missing um, to some degree. And, and I, I just throw in this and then I'll, I'll turn it back over so I, I don't take too much time. But, you know, when, when, you, when we look at all the reasons these things are happening, uh, that, that this proposal is being put forward. But then we say, if you're developing a hotel for homeless services, as if you don't need to go through this process, in, in, and I realize this is targeted to the transient use of visitors and, and all of that, there are a whole host of issues as we learned during the pandemic with the administration's policy of moving um, uh, individuals and families out of the shelter system and into hotels um, and doing that without the necessary services has really had an incredibly negative impact on, on those neighborhoods. So we either could justify doing all of this this way, or we can justify not doing any of this. I just don't feel like at this moment in time, and obviously this is the beginning of public review, that either seems to be explained well enough 
to know where to land on it. So I guess the you know time will tell as we move ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, I see Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, noting the long-term uh, adverse impacts that were identified on the hotel and tourism industry, has the department given thought to a sunset provision in the text amendment, say six, seven years where this can be reviewed again and uh, modified based on our findings and, and actual on the ground <clears throat> facts in the future? So let me, so, so you're suggesting that um, that if this put the proposal in the, the process now and, and then in six years, see if it's been effectively um, addressing the I'm, concerns or? Yeah, I'm suggesting yeah. that it, it has an automatic sunset built in. Right now we're dealing with the uh, impact of the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, that being said, this would be uh, very helpful to the hotel industry to recover. And at the same time, I noted that the uh, environment Im impact statement noted a long-term uh, effect uh, impacting the mm -hmm. hotel and tourism industry. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this would give us, uh, if we put it in place today and had it automatically sunset, the commission in six mm -hmm. years can mm -hmm. review it again and decide based mm -hmm. on the facts and merits of it. Uh, it, it would probably mitigate any law, it would mitigate the actual impact that's been identified for the long term. So. Mm -hmm. I think we should give some thought to having it automatically sunset. It'll serve our purpose okay. now and it'll uh, mitigate the impacts that were identified in the report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Eady. Good afternoon. Um, so, you know, one of the reasonings given for this proposal has to do with conflicts in neighborhoods with na local neighborhoods and local businesses. I was wondering if you could share with us, you know, what, which areas those concerns, I mean, you shared us with us some examples, but geographically, which areas those concerns have been raised in? And is Midtown Manhattan or, you know, the, the business districts, one of those areas that these concerns have been raised? And also in regards to, um, you know, the finding of a, impairing future use and development in surrounding areas. You know, it's not clear to me, even some of the examples you provided that if those had been improved or approved, that those would impede the future development in those areas. So it's not clear to me how these two there's two, two different questions. One is mm -hmm. areas where the conflicts have been identified. And the other is how have these projects impeded development in the areas where they were built, even if these are ones we don't like and would seek to not have approved in the future? Sure, so to, to the first question, um, you know, hotels are, are permitted today in a very wide variety of different kinds of districts. As you point out, there's a central business district and then there are you know, commercial overlays in the boroughs that are much further out and, and have much less sort of commercial activity and, and until the last decade have experienced very little, if any, hotel development. So we really, we're really hearing concerns and complaints and recommendations coming from all different kinds of contexts and some where there have been a lot of hotels and, and it has, has sort of changed the sort of nature of that area. In other areas where the hotel is, is actually conflicting with an adjacent use or, or was developed in a way that was not particularly sensitive to the surrounding context. Um, and, and to the second question, Commissioner Edie, the, um, with regard to what, what would, uh, what, how, how would the finding have addressed it? Um, the, the, I don't think there are many circumstances in which a hotel would be inappropriate. Um, there certainly may be, and, and it really uh, is about the, the, the context of the neighborhood. It does not preclude hotel development, um, nor would it deem all future hotels inappropriate. It, it requires the CPC to really assess each development based on the neighborhood context. Um, and, you know, I think we, you might, in this sort of the examples in the slides, I think left to their own devices, we're seeing hotel development um, take full advantage of sort of the flexibility they have in zoning to build to build developments that aren't 
you know, particularly sensitive to surrounding context. And there's an example at the end of the presentation where I think by their own volition, the developer chose to design a, a to situate the building in such a way where it's more thoughtful to the surrounding context, it's addressed in a way that that really mitigates some potential conflicts with surrounding uses. And um, we think it's a good example of the, the kind of development that we would like to see as a result of this, or that it's intended as part of this. Understood. Okay, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see the public testimony. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Aina, I think I had saw your hand go up. Thank you, Chair. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get uh, contacted. Yeah. So um, most, most of my concerns have been addressed by the prior statements the commissioners have made, and Jen is aware of that because we had a conversation last week. So I, I do appreciate the comments that have been made, the concerns that have been addressed. Because I too questioned um, the necessity and the longevity of the of the hotel special permit. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Commissioner. And Commissioner Rumpershad. Um, yeah, the question I actually had was, I believe it was a slide 12. You talked about they have to have foundation permits. Now, that doesn't mean the foundation has to be in, because if my understanding, when you do rezonings, don't they have to be in in order to be vested? So how is this different when it comes to the mm -hmm. hotels? Sure, I'll explain. And, and it, it, it is, it is a, a complex proposal because we wanted to, to be thoughtful. A typical rule is that um, if you want to vest under the current rules, you have to have your foundations complete at the date of adoption. What we're saying in this case is that you have to have an application, just an application filed at Department of Buildings by referral, which is today. Um, and you have to have your zoning plans approved by the date of adoption. There's a, a second set of projects, which I will, I think is best to sort of characterize as aging projects. And so those are those are projects that that filed their applications at DOB, you know, prior to 2018. They have been around a long time, and the the the, the reason why we're having we have kind of an extra standard for this category of aging projects. They have to, all they have to have done has been filed by the referral date, but by the date of adoption, they need need a, a, a foundation um, per, a foundation permit issued, not to have the foundations complete just the permit issued for the foundation. And if it's just because of pattern of aging projects, we wanna make sure that they are you know, real projects and that they are sort of motivated to move forward and, and sort of uh, recover this supply that we think will be necessary to recover from the pandemic. I hope that addresses the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the clarification on that. Commissioner Knight. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I have two questions. And one of the first question builds on Commissioner Edie's reference to looking at areas of conflict that have been identified. So, so the question is, did the department start with the premise that this should be a citywide proposition or did it contemplate looking at specific areas? So um, we were asked by the administration to look into a a citywide special permit. We have done a number of special permits across the city. Um, and that was really the, the starting point for this framework. Um, and we are, you know, as part of the public process, interested in hearing about whether it can be approved. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is related to unintended consequences. So, you know, for example, there is going to be a multi billion dollar project. Um, to expand JFK Airport. And um, there are a number of plans for uh, more hotel development uh, around the facility. And I think that um, given the community board's uh, posture around hotels, they certainly want to see them in the context of uh, hotels for visitors as economic development drivers but do not want to see um, hotels that support um, homeless individuals without services. And so you can get a situation where, you know, a community very much wants a hotel, but does not want a facility for homeless individuals that would not have the supportive services for them. So I just want to bring that to the fore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that concern. So they, as, as um, Alex explained in the presentation and similar to the um, special permit in M1 districts, we are excluding those hotels that, uh, or I should say use group five. Um, so non-commercial hotels that are, are purpose built for, the, for, for, for shelters or for emergency housing. So you couldn't, you can't do this sort of bait and switch where you might, you know, come in and, and um, file as a, as a public purpose hotel and not get the special permit and then switch to a commercial hotel. So that it will be really be purpose built and more, um, DHS will have to be more thoughtful in terms of where the locations are. They won't be driven by sort of the, the, the market driving where, where those, those buildings are being built. Um, you know, that said, we were really meaning to address the concerns around commercial hotels with this and did not want to affect the city's ability to meet its obligation to provide shelters. Um, you know, that said, as, as, as the uh, project materials share, we do expect that this will slow, somewhat slow the pace of new development and significantly limit that incentive for commercial hotel operators to convert to a shelter later. Um, so uh, we are, are trying to sort of hold that policy harmless, but also trying to separate the business of commercial hotels from the business of uh, appropriate housing for, for the city's homeless individuals. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, next is Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, thank you. I, um, many of the other questions that my colleagues have asked are running through my mind as well, and I'll look forward to uh, learning up more um, about them as we go through the public review. I have to say this is um, it's a very unusual application for us because I think it's the first time in my memory that we're asked to um, understand and assess a project that's going to have such impacts on the city economically. We don't usually see, you know, the socioeconomic effect we usually see has to do with affordable housing. And I don't remember seeing one that has to do with such an arrow um, into the city's budget. So that's going to require some careful thinking on our part. Um, Jen, in your remarks, um, several paragraphs before, I think in conversation with, um, I can't remember who, anyway, you um, explained that one of the benefits here is that we would have an opportunity to be sure that um, new hotels um, respond more thoughtfully to the surrounding context, but which I think is an important um, thing for us to look at. But um, I'd like to ask how, understand better how that works under the findings that are proposed here. The, these proposed findings um, are very vague, doesn't talk about the neighborhood context. It just talks about impairing future use or development of the surrounding mm -hmm. area. Um, so as we get deeper into this, I'm gonna have more focused questions about uh, what the criteria for that um, are. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think it sounds to me like the kind of thing where any um, purposeful applicant could make a good case um, that would support the finding and we really ha wouldn't have much basis for shaping anything. So that's more of a comment than a question. Okay. Um, and then I just like, maybe you have something to say in response to that, but let me put my other factual question out there in case you want to respond to that. And that is what other uses are, it's very unusual to have a special permit apply across mm -hmm. the city as you pointed out. And I certainly understand the desire to um, make um, a coherent set, a consistent set of rules um, for the many cases in the special districts in which we have a requirement for special permit. Those all had to do with shaping development patterns because rezonings were intended to create a certain result and you didn't want hotels to come, sort of undermine um, mm -hmm. the planning rationale for the rezoning. But when we're doing it citywide, it's something entirely different. What other uses are there in the zoning resolution that no matter where they are in the city require a special permit? Sure. Um, so to, uh, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll answer your question and then I'll comment on your comments and thank you for that. Um, there are an, a, a, a 
handful of uses that are, are only permitted by special permits. I believe uh, public parking garages with it's either more than 150 or 200 spaces if the zoners and the, if, if Howard wants to correct me, please jump in. Um, as well as a number of uses uh, such as um, I believe uh, stadiums um, and infrastructure related uses are, are require special permits. Um, and to your second question, I mean, not a question, but your comment about about the finding and, and the, the standard that we would be considering applications on. Um, I, you know, I think the, the intention of the special permit is not to preclude hotel development. Um, we believe we still believe they're appropriate in this wide variety of neighborhoods and that serve, serve many um, serve many communities in very different ways. Um, and the, the finding is, is really intended to allow for, for a consistent approach. I mean, currently we have, I think, you know, nine or 10 different special permits, each with a sort of slightly different flavors of, of a similar finding. And, um, it, you know, I, I do think that, that it allows for a sufficient lab to, to think like address where the, the access and egress to the site are and how it, it relates to the, within the, the context of the bulk envelope, how it relates to the surrounding uses in a way that um, you know it, it is really more sensitive and allows for better development. <clears throat> and there, there are, are um, there is latitude in there for the commission to um, apply conditions to uh, safeguard the to ensure the safety of the surrounding area, safeguard conditions in the surrounding area. So that standard special permit finding is still part of it. Uh, a site plan is is, is a required. Um, is required in the application as it is in any special permit application. And, uh, I'll just add to that very briefly. Um, first of all, yes, it's 100 uh, parking, public parking facilities of 150 spaces or more are the ones that are subject to uh, CPC special permit uh, requirements citywide. And I, just with respect to the, the findings, um, the findings reflect that this is a use permit too. And so, you know, aspects of the, the site plan that relate to use compatibility are the ones that we're trying to focus on. It's not a heightened setback special permit. It's not a bulk special permit. So the findings don't reflect the kind of um, issues that you might see in a permit that was providing that kind of relief. So it's really oriented towards the use compatibility. Uh, and so elements of the, plan, of the proposal that speak to use compatibility are the ones that we're trying to focus on here. Commissioner Ortiz. Sure, thank you. Um, Commissioner Levin asked my question uh, on, uh, with respect to land, you know, what other uses face this level of scrutiny? Um, I, I'm curious, you know, what do those things have in common? Hotels seem a, fair, a fairly common um, use, unlike stadiums, for, for instance, um, and why is it appropriate to apply level of scrutiny that you're proposing to this particular use? Sure, I'm actually gonna let, let Howard address this question because I think it, it relates more broadly to sort of citywide policies on this. Uh, Howard, would you like to? Sure, and I think, that, uh, uh, Commissioner, your, your question is about what is it about hotels that warrants this kind of regulation? And the, 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 the proposal is oriented around the notion that hotels are a, are a sort of a singular kind of use in that they're not, they're commercial and they're residential, but they're not entirely commercial and they're not entirely residential. They're, they're unusual with respect to their land use characteristics. Um, the, and, and thus they are different from some of the contexts in which they might commonly locate. And thus that's the, the why this recommendation uh, in this proposal is to, you know, apply a different level of review to hotels than might be applied to other types of uses Then we might see fit to, to, to apply to other types of uses. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that hotels and parking facilities, uh, you know, have, have that, that much in common, but I think that the idea is that um, if you want to draw the analogy to parking facilities, those are uses that are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, the larger parking facilities, um, to see if they have negative localized effects. And in that sense, there is some similarity to the uh, nature of the review that's being proposed here. Is there a use compatibility problem with the nature of the proposed hotel? I guess I find that a little difficult to understand given the fact that we have hotels uh, scattered throughout the city historically for, for a very long time. 
um, that have not been subject to this level of scrutiny and exist just fine, you know, side by side in an urban environment, very different from the other thing, in my opinion, at least very different from the other uses that you've mentioned. I also have a question with respect to um, also unintended consequences. Um, uh, you know, in, in some of the um, uh, material that uh, we've reviewed and certainly the, the coverage on this, I think, you know, a concern was raised about the impact that this would have um, on our hotel capacity. Um, and, you know, the concerns we have about a very, an industry that's been hammered because of COVID, you know, why is now, I think this, you know, Commissioner Cervillo mentioned this, you know, why is now the right time to um, inject uh, discretionary approval process on an industry that, um, you know, we are very concerned about as a city. Um, but, you know, one thing I don't know that has come up yet, you know, if, if we, and I, I don't know that you would say you buy this, but, you know, folks have argued that insufficient hotel capacity leads to high costs, might hamper visitation um, for our um, tourism industry. Another, something that came up for me is, um, you know, sort of water flows downhill, right? If, if visitors don't have hotel rooms, um, and either they choose not to come or they choose to come anyway, does this make Airbnb and temporary lodging more attractive, which in turn hampers, you know, how it affects housing affordability and has a negative impact on the housing market? I think that's uh, an angle that really I have concerns about that would affect everyday New Yorkers and, and wondered the extent that ha that had come up in your discussions. Sure, and specifically on the question of Airbnb, the, um, the DEIS does look at, so, so as, as you mentioned, there's this projected shortfall of rooms. And I should say that this is, this shortfall is really about uh, future growth. We're projecting that by, by the build year, there will be, the inventory will be sufficient to support the levels of tourism that existed prior to the pandemic, so which is record levels of tourism. So it's really about um, the uh, acknowledging that the permit will slow the growth of hotels and in an environment where we anticipate that, that the demand will not only return but grow at the pace it was growing prior to the pandemic in terms of visitation, that you do, you do have a, short, a, a rather significant shortfall of rooms in, in, in the future to meet this need. And so the, the question that the, the, the DEIS explored, that the consultants explored in the DEIS is, well, you know, where, where do, where do the, how do those rooms, the visitors that might go to those rooms, where do they go? And so, you know, the assumption is that, um, you know, some of it will go to nearby jurisdictions where, where there the, the, the construction of hotels is less constrained or where occupancy rates are much lower, um, where they can, the, the industry, the, the hotels, the inventory there can, can support higher occupancy rates. Um, it also looks at, it also assumes about a third of that is going to go to um, friends and family um, or Airbnb within the city. And, and what it looks at, and it sort of it just sort of looks generally at, at basically the city's sort of non-hotel stock of, of places where overnight visitors might sleep. Um, there has been some, there has been growth in Airbnb in the city over recent years. Um, you know, however, we don't assume that any of that growth would um, not be permitted, that those would be legal Airbnbs. Um, and because the, uh, there is also, there are separate um, efforts to, to limit illegal Airbnbs because of concerns around housing costs. So um, we don't, so this, this really doesn't assume a lot of, um, that, that, Airbnb can absorb a lot of, of, of that growth. And, and then it also assumes that a certain amount of the visitation will, will just that visitors will not come because they don't have a place to stay in the city. And, um, and that is the basis of, of, of the impact that is disclosed in the DEIS. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're replacing one set of problems with, with another. I mean, you raised a number of issues. Why would we want people to stay in other jurisdictions? We want them in New York. You know, they're spending... Um, happens in and around the vicinity of their hotel, some of it, why would we leave a single dollar, you know, on the table and encourage people to go elsewhere or make it more difficult to stay and, and, you know, that Airbnb, it, it happens legally or illegally, we create another problem 
on that end. Um, so, you know, those are just the concerns that I, that I have. Um, and, and I also, uh, one last thing, you know, another, uh, you know, something that was mentioned in the New York Times piece that uh, Commissioner Cerullo mentioned is that special permits um, for similar requirements in other neighborhoods during the Bloomberg era resulted in no hotels being built under those rules. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, most of in, under the Bloomberg rules, we haven't seen much. Um, many of those areas were, are, you know, were more residential in character. Um, we do believe there's some applications coming through now. And the M1, M1 which was much more recent, um, has not really had time to allow those projects to move forward. Also because M1 vested a rather large pipeline of projects. Um, we have not seen a significant amount of uh, construction coming under the special permit. You know, that said, it continues to be allowed in many other areas of the city. Um, and that's where we have seen the majority of the new construction. Okay, so in this case, it sounds like the special permit did in fact hamper development. Yeah, and that we, we, you know, we do expect that this will slow some of, of the development. We do, we do believe that the industry will adapt and, and in this environment that demand will be enough that, that it will be worth pursuing. Um, but we do expect that there will be some slowing of the construction of, of new hotels as a result of the special permit. It, it seems like a, a, a risky assumption, um, but thank you. Commissioner Eady. Thanks once again. Um, I just want to talk a little about <clears throat> the conflicts we, uh, you described earlier um, in local neighborhoods and local businesses. And, you know, site planning is one of those funny things where we have residential buildings and office buildings also that sometimes aren't well thought through and planned properly. And, you know, we in the past have often created um, requirements for street wall continuity and things of that nature to mitigate or to avoid those type problems. Had we looked at those type solutions here as well um, in order to avoid such, using such a heavy hammer, whether or not there were other requirements we can create in, for hotels uh, where they're allowed as of right. I'm, generally speaking, a fan of as a right development. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's my question. Mm -hmm. thank okay, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, we were asked to have a citywide approach to respond to the types of concerns that have been raised with respect to new hotels in a variety of different locations, some of which currently have street wall requirements and some which do not. Um, and there are, you know, there are already a number of special permits in locations throughout the city, including in all the M1 districts, and, and this was our starting point. Yes. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bernie. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Jennifer and staff. Um, I, I think one thing that your um, EIS <clears throat> didn't adequately address is the additional uh, stress and mental anguish imposed on the members of this commission by a stream of hotel permit applications uh, that are kind of come our way. And I'm wondering what you might do to mitigate that impact. I'm not sure that psychological impacts are within the scope of Seeker. <laughs> but um, no, in, in all seriousness though, um, you know, I, I do appreciate you in terms of, of, of workload. I mean, certainly there will be, um, you know, more applications and we you know we're a nimble agency. We, we adjust fluctuating workloads as, as best as we can. And um, we usually, are capable of, of moving things. But I mean, in, in all seriousness, yeah. it, do you have a sense of how many permanent applications this would actually generate? Is it uh, yeah. historically, how many have we have we seen? Yeah, I mean, you know, what we have seen, um, you know, we it's, it's mostly allowed as of right in most areas currently, even though there are a number of areas that we have a special permit in most places in the city, we allow it as of right. So, um, and you know, there is obviously some, you know, there will be a limit on capacity to put things through the process. Um, and which is why the, the DEIS is, is so sort of conservatively assumes, I think it's um, you know, 10, 10 special permits a year. And this is really looking back at a range of other types of actions that facilitated hotel developments that may not necessarily have been special permits, but they may have been um, you know, zoning map amendments um, or other actions before the commission that, that 
that advance the special permit. And so we, we base the assumption on, on our historic ability to process that volume of applications. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah. So, I mean, so we can expect you know, like one a month or something. And, and I'm just thinking about the, you know, the cries from the hotel development community that we are going to be an obstacle to their, even if every permit is approved, you know, we're an obstacle to their development process. Yeah. I mean, and certainly I think as I acknowledged in my opening remarks, um, the process uh, does add additional, it does add additional steps to the development process. And our expectations is that is, is that we will see fewer hotels as a result of the special permit. So, um, we do acknowledge that, and part of the reason is 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 the, uh, the the time and cost associated with going through a public review process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Just to clarify, will the special permit allow us to uh, permit the building of hotels in areas that are not currently as of right, such as like an R five district? No, uh, it only applies to areas where hotels are permitted today. Um, yeah, there, there might be some instances. Now that we're looking at it holistically, there might be some mm -hmm. instances where there are some neighborhoods that would want a hotel and okay. would have a hotel yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that, that are not currently permitted today. Uh, mm -hmm. So perhaps if we brought in the scope, since we're starting with a fresh page, we might as well look at that too. Mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll just add that yeah. uh, in order to, if, if there is a location where there is an interest, uh, uh, currently zoned for residential, there's an interest in, in, in establishing a hotel, the actions presumably would include the mapping of a commercial district in which that would, that would permit the hotel um, uh, and accompanied by a special permit application for the specific hotel project. So that would be the vehicle under, you know, not, 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 not to disregard your question, to, but notwithstanding that under the framework we've proposed, in order to create a hotel in an R5 district today, you'd have to map it as a commercial district and seek the special permit under that commercial district. The problem that I could see was that with that is that we don't do spot zoning. So we'd have to broaden the uh, commercial district and perhaps it, it only benefits the community to have a hotel on a, on a very limited area. So mm -hmm. this might okay. be a mechanism to, to avert that broadening of a commercial district where it really doesn't belong, but a hotel, since as we did note earlier, is quasi-residential, quasi-commercial, it might be appropriate. And it might serve certain communities. And obviously through this process, should this application get passed, the community board and, uh, and the borough presidents will all have a say and stake in it. So this okay. might be an opportunity to fix that. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. Other questions from the commission? I want to thank you for the robust list of issues that you've put forward, many of which we anticipated, but at all, as always, the department benefits from the commission because um, individuals with different expertise and you've raised issues, you've suggested areas of inquiry that we had not considered before. So thank you for that. And um, then this application um, will be referred to all community boards, all borough boards, and all borough presidents for 90 days. Great. Uh, so uh, the item two on our agenda has been laid over. Um, item number three is a certification of special permits in Manhattan Community District 5. Our presenter is Scott Williamson, and I believe Commissioner Cirillo indicated that he is recused on this. Is that correct? That's correct, Ryan. Thank you so much. Let me right. know when to come back. Okay. We will. Thank you. Right, Scott, go ahead. Good afternoon. This is an application by Boston Properties in partnership with the MTA, uh, and it's seeking to develop a commercial office tower on the site mm -hmm. at 317 to 341 Madison Avenue in the East Midtown neighborhood of Manhattan Community District 5. The site formerly accommodated the MTA's headquarters building and is also known as 343 Madison Avenue. Uh, the project will bring Class A office space to an area that is well served by mass transit and has a high density commercial office character. Uh, it will also create an opportunity for significant infrastructure upgrades and revenue generation for the MTA. Next slide, please. 
So the applicant is requesting two special permits to enable the proposed office tower development, both of which are available only to sites within the Vanderbilt corridor sub area. The first is a bonus floor area special permit pursuant to zoning resolution section 81633. It allows a bonus of up to 15 FAR to sites that undertake improvements to the pedestrian or mass transit circulation network in association with development. The second special permit is a waiver special permit uh, and it's pursuant to the following section of 81634. It enables recipients of the initial bonus floor area special permit to request waivers where accommodating that floor area is made prohibitive by other regulations. Next slide, please. So before we discuss the project, let's orientate ourselves with the site and its surrounds. 343 Madison Avenue is indicated with the yellow star and the red dashed outline here on the slide on the block bounded by East 45th Street to the north, Vanderbilt Avenue to the east, East 44th Street to the south and Madison Avenue to the west. The development site is located in the heart of Midtown's central business district, uh, much of which is mapped C53 and has a base FAR of 15 for non-residential uses. The area is characterized by high density commercial office buildings. A strong street wall also defines the section of Madison Avenue, uh, and it generally has retail activating the ground floor as well. The area is served by Grand Central Station located one block to the southeast. Uh, available there is the 4567 and shuttle subway lines, uh, as well as the major terminus of the Metro North Railroad. The Long Island Railroad will also have a major terminus here uh, to be known as East Side Access, uh, which is planned for opening in late 2022. Next slide, please. So the site, uh, as I mentioned, is within the Vanderbilt Corridor sub area, which is outlined here in orange. Uh, and it's part of the much larger special Midtown District, uh, which is indicated in the map on the left here. The Vanderbilt Corridor provisions were adopted by the CPC in 2015, seeking to facilitate commercial development while improving pedestrian circulation around Grand Central. The recently completed one Vanderbilt project was the first to utilize the Vanderbilt Corridor provisions, and it comprises a 30 FAR commercial office building on the southernmost block of the Vanderbilt Corridor. That project is inclusive of numerous privately funded improvements to nearby transit infrastructure. The map on the right here shows the, Grand, the Greater East Midtown uh, rezoning, which was adopted by the CPC in June of 2017. Uh, and that uh, change to the text incorporated the Vanderbilt Corridor's provisions uh, as well. Next slide, please. So 343 Madison Avenue is shaded here in orange. Uh, it sits centrally within the Vanderbilt Corridor sub area. Uh, and you can see at the bottom, uh, the one Vanderbilt uh, development as well. So as the owner of 343 Madison Avenue, the MTA released a request for proposals in 2013 for parties to undertake a redevelopment of the site under a 99 year ground lease. Boston Properties was successful in that request for proposals and are therefore a party to the current application. Next slide, please. So going below the surface here, the site exists in an area of major below ground transit infrastructure. The site is outlined in red on the left of the figure here, and immediately beside it is the east side access concourse and the Metro North Railroad terminus. Uh, close by are also several subway lines. As part of encouraging ongoing development, a fundamental driver of the Vanderbilt Corridor text is facilitating privately funded improvements to this infrastructure. So to this end, the proposed redevelopment of 343 Madison Avenue is accompanied by upgrades to circulation in and around the network you can see here. We'll discuss more of the specifics of the improvements a little later in the, the presentation. Next slide, please. So taking a look at the, the development site specifically, uh, 343 Madison Avenue is shown here uh, with the red dashed outline with frontage to Madison Avenue, 44th Street and 45th Streets. The development site has, uh, the development site lot has an area of about uh, 25,100 square feet. The development site is made up of three vacant commercial office buildings. Between 1979 and 2014, those buildings were used as the headquarters for MTA. The buildings have been vacant since 2014 and are in the process of being demolished now. Also within the development site is the blue shaded area, which fronts 44th Street. That represents a five-story ventilation structure, which provides ventilation to the east side access concourse, which is deep below the site. This structure will remain uh, under this proposal, uh, but, as, as, but as part of the proposed zoning lot, the proposed development will cantilever above that structure. 
The remainder of the block is made up of 52 Vanderbilt Avenue, which is a 20 story commercial building on the Northeast corner of the, on the Southeast corner of the block is the Yale club, which is a 22 story building constructed in 1915 in the Renaissance revival style. The Yale club is listed as a New York city landmark also. Next slide, please. So to give some visual context to that, this is the view from Madison Avenue looking east uh, at the development site. You can see the existing vacant MTA HQ buildings here in the center, uh, and they span 44th Street on the right to 45th Street on the left. Behind the green scaffolding, uh, you can see those buildings here. The proposed development would occupy the full frontage uh, that is shown behind the green scaffolding. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the view from 45th Street looking south. You can see the development site on the right fronting Madison Avenue, including a small service building in the center of the frontage. Uh, on the left fronting Vanderbilt Avenue is the commercial building at 52 Vanderbilt Avenue and highlighted in orange with the dashed line. You can see that this building also has a passage that connects below grounds to Grand Central Terminal. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the view from 44th Street looking north. You can see the development site on the left fronting Madison Avenue. Uh, you can also see the five-story ventilation structure located centrally within the 44th Street frontage. Uh, on the right fronting Vanderbilt Avenue is the landmark Yale Club. Next slide, please. So with that background, I'll now run through the details of each of the proposed actions. The first being a special permit for Grand Central Public Realm improvements. It allows an increase in the maximum permitted FAR on this site from 15 to 30 FAR in connection with on-site and off-site improvements being made to the pedestrian or mass transit circulation network. The special permit also takes into account matters of building design, bulk, character, and sustainability of the resulting development, uh, and those are attributes we'll step through now. Next slide, please. So here's a rendering of the proposed development in the context of its East Midtown surrounds, looking east towards uh, Brooklyn and Queens. The large building on the right is one Vanderbilt, uh, the only other development to have utilized the proposed special permit previously. So the proposed development itself is a 753,000 zoning square foot or 30 FAR commercial office building uh, with a height of 1,050 feet. You can see that its bulk is made up of three modules, uh, a lower, a middle and upper sections, which are defined by setbacks, uh, mechanical area and amenity floors with terraces. The modules reflect an effort to better distribute the worker population throughout the building uh, in a post-pandemic setting. Next slide, please. So here's the ground floor plan of the proposed building showing you how it will uh, interact with the street. First, uh, you can see the ventilation structure on 44th Street, which remains uh, at ground floor level. Uh, retail activation is proposed on the 44th Street frontage and Madison Avenue corner, as well as part of the 45th Street frontage at the top. Uh, and both of those areas are shaded in orange. A large portion of the Madison Avenue frontage has been dedicated to servicing a high volume lobby that has been dimensioned in such a way to ensure flexibility is available for, for things like temperature screening and queuing of occupants uh, as they arrive in the building, uh, again, in consideration of uh, a post pandemic setting. Also important to note is the building's core on the eastern side of the floor plate, where you can see numerous elevator banks and servicing areas uh, have been concentrated. Now looking to the Madison Avenue and 45th Street corner, the area highlighted in yellow is proposed to be occupied by a high volume pedestrian entrance to the east side access concourse, which is deep below the sites. This 2,370 square foot space is part of the transit improvement package proposed with the application. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a rendering of that east side access entrance and the proposed building above it at Madison Avenue and the 45th and 45th Street at the corner there. You can see the east side access entrance is proposed as a double height space that is integrated into the architecture of the building. The design recesses the corner in such a way as to define the space uh, as public and distinct from the more private uses that occupy the ground floor plane. The entrance will have up to 60 feet of frontage to Madison Avenue and 35 feet of frontage to 45th Street. Next slide, please. So the east side access point will contain three 40 inch wide escalators, as well as a six foot wide stair and an ADA elevator, all connecting to the east side access concourse below the sites. Uh, there's also a back of house stair along the eastern boundary being provided. Next slide, please. 
Uh, here you can see the new concourse, which is shaded in the lighter yellow color, again, which is sort of deep below the site, uh, and how it aligns with the development site, which is in the brighter yellow color. Uh, you can also see in blue shading the new platform alignment of the Long Island Railroad uh, as it terminates at the site access um, concourse. The proposed entrance is in a particularly strategic location here, corresponding to the southernmost end of the train as it pulls into the station terminus. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's some more detail of how the pedestrian connection drops below ground and into the new concourse. From here, commuters can turn right to connect underground to Grand Central Terminal or the east side access restrooms. To the left, commuters will find the southernmost platform access via the escalator bank uh, at the top of the image there. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a section of the proposed connection shaded in yellow and looking north. Uh, the proposed building is located above uh, and is shaded in blue with Madison Avenue on the left. Uh, you can see the arrangement here has been carefully engineered to drop passengers below the level of the eastern neighbor at 52 Vanderbilt, uh, as well as the Metro North Railroad train shed that sits below 52 Vanderbilt. Uh, it then meets the design configuration of the new concourse below, which is uh, already constructed. Next slide, please. So the proposal is also inclusive of sidewalk widenings around the future building, which will assist with pedestrian congestion. The Madison Avenue sidewalk adjacent the site will be widened by seven feet, uh, which is shown here in green to achieve uh, a total sidewalk width of 20 feet. The 45th Street sidewalk will be widened by at least five feet where adjacent the proposed development as shown here in blue to achieve a minimum of 15 feet of sidewalk width. Due to the east side access volume immediately adjacent this blue area, uh, this widening could not actually be accommodated within the development site itself, uh, and therefore is proposed to extend the sidewalk five feet into the roadbed. Both of these widenings are a zoning requirement and are not, are not linked to any bonus floor area. The 44th Street sidewalk already measures 15 feet wide uh, and as such will remain at its current width. Next slide, please. So now we'll take a look at some of the offsite improvements that are proposed as part of the proposal. Uh, they're located a short distance uh, to the south of the, the southeast of the site, beneath 42nd Street at Lexington Avenue. That location is shaded in the red box here at the bottom uh, right of the figure. The improvements relate to the Flushing Avenue subway line, or also known as the 7 train, uh, at Grand Central and 42nd Street station. Uh, and they've been identified by the MTA as a priority for this project to address. Next slide, please. Uh, so zooming in a little, this figure captures the whole of the 42nd Street 7 train uh, platform uh, and it's shaded in green. The proposed improvements are shown in yellow uh, and the upgrades really try and target congestion across the platform by better distributing commuters uh, across the length of the platform. Uh, it's also worth noting here just graphically that Lexington Avenue comprises the boundary between Manhattan Community Boards 5 and 6. So some of these improvements actually exist in Community Board 6, while others uh, and the proposed development itself are in Manhattan Community Districts uh, 5. Next slide, please. So zooming in again, uh, this slide shows the westernmost improvement to the platform, which involves widening of the widening of an existing stair. The existing circumstances are shown in the top diagram in green, and the improvement is shown uh, in the bottom diagram highlighted in yellow. This widening will result in an additional lane of pedestrian flow on this step. Next slide, please. Uh, another proposed improvement involves the construction of a new pedestrian passageway and two stairwells. Again, the existing circumstances are shown in the top diagram in green with the new passage and the stairs uh, highlighted in yellow at the bottom. The passage will be approximately 11 feet wide uh, and 120 feet long, and it leads to a new stair that will land centrally within the platform to better distribute commuters along the length of the platform. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of the, where that passage would be located today. Next slide, please. And here's a rendering of the proposed extension of that passage. Next slide, please. Uh, the third improvement involves the widening of an existing stair also, this time located at the easternmost end of the same platform. The existing circumstances are shown in the top diagram in green with the proposed widening um, highlighted in yellow at the bottom. 
This widening will result in an additional two lanes of pedestrian flow uh, on the stair. Next slide, please. So uh, again, here's, that pic here's a picture of that stair uh, before the proposed widening. Next slide, please. And here's a rendering of uh, the proposed stair after it's been widened. Next slide, please. Uh, so taking a look more at the building design part of the proposal now, uh, the special permit granting a floor area bonus has a number of findings that relate to the design of the proposed building and its massing. The findings seek to ensure not just that additional floor area is accompanied by transit improvements, uh, but also that the building is designed sensitive to its context. This east facing rendering shows the recently completed one Vanderbilt on the right. Uh, beyond in the back is the MetLife and the Chrysler buildings. Uh, the taller building on the left is 383 Madison Avenue. The proposed design uses a strong street wall, the top of which is indicated here with the orange dotted line to define its base, taking cues from the built form character to the north and south of the site. Setbacks above street wall reiterate the mid-rise and high-rise modules of the building, splitting its bulk roughly into thirds. So we want to note here that while a strong street wall would help contribute to the character of Madison Avenue in this location, uh, the height that is currently proposed here, which is shown at the dotted line, uh, is a little higher than staff have recommended for the site's context. Next slide, please. So this is a massing diagram looking at the building's address to the corner of Madison Avenue and 45th Street, looking southeast where the new east side access entry is proposed. The base uh, or street wall is shown here uh, in the darker shaded blue color with the tower volume recessed in the lighter blue color. You can see the building massing has been arranged to provide emphasis to this corner to highlight the public nature of the new east side access pedestrian entrance um, below at the corner. Next slide, please. So this slide shows some more of the building bulk and floor area distribution throughout the tower, including the three modules. The middle section diagram here shows the building cantilevering out above the ventilation structure for east side access that exists on 44th Street. Uh, and that happens once it reaches six stories above street level. The same section diagram shows the proposed street wall height relative to the height of the Yale Club, uh, the Eastern neighbor, uh, which is a 22 story building that adjoins and it roughly it matches the top of its mechanical bulkhead uh, in the diagram here. Next slide, please. So the proposed tower top takes an orthogonal form that would contrast nearby features of the East Midtown skyline. Uh, notable in proximity is the tapered tower top and spire of one Vanderbilt, uh, as well as the spire and art deco features of the Chrysler building. Also nearby are the octagonal forms of the MetLife building and 383 Madison Avenue. The rendering shows a glass curtain wall integrated into the tower top. The prominence of the side core from the east, uh, which you can see inset there on the right, uh, is shown as a distinguishing feature from the glass curtain wall that makes up the remainder of the building's facade. Uh, and it will contribute a defining vertical element to the tower's architecture. The use of contemporary construction materials throughout will provide a contrast to that of the many granite clad buildings in the area, uh, like the Roosevelt Hotel to the north, uh, the MetLife Building or Grand Central Terminals, while ensuring a high degree of environmental performance also. Next slide, please. So while we're on uh, environmental performance uh, with respect to sustainability, the special permit includes a finding that requires the applicant to detail their proposed sustainability targets and improvements as part of the application. The building is being designed to achieve a LEED Platinum certification. And as a baseline, the building will need to comply with local law 97, which was introduced in 2019. It is anticipated that the energy performance of the proposed development will exceed the requirements of the 2020 New York City Energy Conservation Code, as well as benchmarks set by comparable Class A off buildings uh, nearby, such as uh, one Vanderbilt. Various improvements that will contribute to its environmental performance are explored uh, in the applicant's documentation. Next slide, please. So under the second special permit, which is being requested um, and it's available to sites that have been that have obtained the initial bonus for floor area special permit, uh, it allows those sites to request waivers where accommodating that floor area has been made prohibitive by other regulations. So we'll look at the detail of those waivers now. Next slide, please. So the first waiver relates to relief for street wall continuity. 
Uh, and in particular, the emphasis, the emphasis the design gives to the new east side access entrance uh, has the effect of breaking the street wall on a portion of both the Madison Avenue and 45th Street frontages. The general extent of the recess requiring the waiver uh, is shown uh, illustratively here uh, with the red hatching uh, on the right. Next slide, please. So also regarding street walls, the inset diagram uh, on the right here shows the proposed street wall reaching 321 feet before setting back uh, to the middle of the tower above. This occurs on all three frontages of the site. The Grand Central Subdistrict has a requirement for a street wall of a minimum 120 feet, but a maximum of 150 feet in height. So, I mean, as I touched on earlier, uh, staff agree that a strong street wall is, is appropriate here, uh, and that could perhaps be above 150 feet, which would require a waiver. Uh, however, we have some concerns about the extent of the height being requested here, uh, and the applicant is aware of those. Next slide, please. So above the street wall, the design does not comply with height and setback controls that apply above 150 feet also. Uh, so a waiver is necessary for the daylight evaluation criteria. Uh, the size of the site and its constraints mean that achieving functional commercial floor plates as the building rises uh, cannot actually be achieved while also meeting uh, the terms of the regulation. So a waiver is required. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a diagram showing a number of waivers that are being requested at ground floor level. In the interest of streetscape activation, regulations limit the length of the lobby, the depth of building entrance recesses, and also require an additional lobby entry on a narrow street. Uh, the amount the floor plate is juggling here, combined with its dimensions uh, and the need for ample lobby space for queuing and screening, means waivers are needed uh, to address those regulations. On 44th Street, at the bottom of the diagram, you can also see a curb cut is proposed to allow for three uh, loading berths. The 45 foot wide uh, width necess necessary exceeds the regulation, uh, which limits curb cuts to 25 feet. Finally, regulations require the loading berth to be arranged to permit a head in and head out truck movement, uh, which the configuration and size of this site prevent from being feasible. Next slide, please. So just briefly, some of the application requirements for the first special permit uh, relate to the trends and improvements proposed uh, and whether they've been endorsed conceptually by public agencies. Uh, there are also conditions that relate to the sidewalk widening uh, and pedestrian circulation, building design and its context, uh, as well as the sustainable design elements, uh, all of which we've, we've covered in the slides earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, again, to avoid you having to try and read all of this, uh, the findings themselves address matters like the quality of improvements proposed, uh, ensuring that they provide a benefit to the circulation in the network, and also that the improvements themselves merit the amount of floor area being granted. Uh, there's also further findings regarding building, plat building program, I'm sorry, building design and building bulk, uh, ensuring its contribution to the streetscape and surrounds, uh, and will advance the goals of the special midtown district. Next slide, please. The findings of the second special permit, which is the, the waiver special permit, speak to modifications being made to the regulations that ensure a better site plan uh, and an enlargement that is harmonious with the strategy for the special midtown district. They also seek to ensure that modification of street wall height and setback regulations uh, result in the improved distribution of oak to ensure a harmonious outcome with the goals of the special midtown district. Next slide, please. Uh, so a draft environmental impact statement was prepared for the project uh, and no, impasse, in, no adverse impacts were found for almost all of the categories analyzed. Uh, there was identified a potential for traffic, transit and pedestrian uh, impacts uh, for which mitigation measures will be suggested in the final uh, environmental impact statement. Uh, and all of this is detailed in the DIS materials that uh, have been published. Next slide, please. So to summarize, uh, the applicant is seeking to construct the 30 FAR commercial office building. The project is accompanied by significant improvements to the mass transit circulation network, both on and off the development site. To facilitate that development, the applicant is seeking two Vanderbilt corridor special permits. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Scott. Questions from the commission. Vice Chair Knuckles. 
Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so just to clarify, the proposed uh, improvements uh, for the transit uh, network are uh, under consideration by the MTA? What, or what is the status of that, uh, uh, of that question? So the MTA has endorsed the, the improvements that have been put forward, uh, and much of those have been recommended by the MTA to be conducted in, in parallel with this project. Uh, so I think that the developer is actually acting on direct suggestions of, uh, of the MTA for those specific upgrades. Okay, uh, I thought in your, uh, one of the slides I saw was a side-by-side -side analysis between uh, this, this proposed project and one Vanderbilt, uh, or was that an illusion on my part? Uh, no, so that is, is, is a slide I have available. It's in the appendix. Uh, and what it is doing is um, uh, production. I don't know if it's possible to go to the very last slide of the appendix. Uh, and that's just putting side by side the uh, environmental or sustainability uh, in, uh, attributes of each development uh, and how one stacks up against the other. So you can see that there. Um, it's quite technical, which is the reason I, I don't have it in the, the actual presentation itself. Um, but I mean, it, it talks to things like thermostats and HVAC systems and things like that to uh, elaborate further on particularly the finding of the initial special permit that requires um, commentary on the sustainability attributes that the, the applicant will be committing to. So, uh, I mean, that information is there uh, and we have it in the presentation, but uh, I didn't speak to the, the specific details of it because it's, uh, uh, it, it's a little in the weeds. I was actually having a conversation about high albedo roofs last night. So uh, it's, uh, um, I'm just wondering, is there a, an approximate uh, valuation on the uh, cost of the um, amenities that, that, that the developers are putting forward? Uh, so I don't have a dollar value for you, uh, and that is for a couple of reasons because it's a little complicated because the, the on-site developments, uh, sorry, the on-site improvements, including the east side access entrance, they will be constructed by the developer, which is Boston Properties. Uh, the off-site improvements will be constructed by the MTA uh, themselves. Uh, so Boston Properties won't actually be involved in that part of it. So uh, there's kind of two different uh, attributes to sort of mix there. And uh, as far as achieving a dollar value for it, as I said, we, we don't have it. Uh, however, there is a finding in the special permit that uh, requires that the amount of the, the, the improvements themselves, which is not specifically dollar value related, but more um, it categorizes the improvements uh, in, a, in terms of their complexity uh, and their need within the system for um, facilitating improved circulation. Uh, and those, the, the stacking up of the improvements that uh, have been proposed uh, is sufficient for the amount of floor area that has been proposed here. So uh, that is primarily what the department has looked at rather than a dollar value uh, estimate of those. Uh, and you know, I guess uh, the, the short answer to your question is the amount of floor area that they have requested is comparable or equivalent to the improvements that they are proposing to undertake as well. Okay, thank you. Well, Commissioner Knuckles, much as I'm looking forward to being able to return to cocktail party conversation, I'm not sure that I would want to go to your cocktail party discussing high albedo fruits. That's my first choice. <laughs> um, Commissioner Bernie. I would contradict that. I'll come and talk roofing with you, uh, Chair, any, Vice Chair, anytime. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Scott. This is a really interesting project in a number of ways. I mean, I think. Um, it's a sign of what's coming out of the East Midtown rezoning. And I think that these uh, extensive improvements to the transit system would not have happened without the East Midtown zoning. And um, it's also interesting that Boston properties are forging ahead with 750,000 square feet of office space at a time when other people are questioning whether we can even fill the office space we have. So I'd be interested to see, I'd be interested to hear what's in their thinking um, as they do that but they must have confidence that they can, they can fill that space, I guess. Um, I have a couple of questions. Could you go to slide 38 on your, on your deck? So um, a couple of things really. I mean, you know, Madison Avenue is one of the primary retail avenues in the city. And it's just a bit disappointing that you get such a tiny little piece of retail. And I'm just thinking that the, um, the, the, the end of the lobby that 
is closest to 44th Street and next to that retail, doesn't look like a particularly useful piece of lobby. Um, I don't really see people standing over there waiting to get in the elevator. And maybe the retail could be expanded a little bit down that end just to provide a, a more viable retail outlet. But the other thing is, you know, on the question of the lobby, um, there the are a number of studies been done by Arup and others uh, modeling um, entrance to office buildings in a post-pandemic setting. And it has to do with uh, the time it takes to load up elevators, particularly if you only allow four people per elevator, get them up to, what is it, um, how many floors? Uh, thousands of people in 750,000 square feet. All the modeling shows that there will be a significant number of people out on the sidewalk waiting even just to get into the lobby because of the way um, these things get backed up. Now that, that's assuming that we're still in the same sort of pandemic, post-pandemic CDC rule mode of, of trying to fill an office building under strict um, distancing rules. But I wonder, did Boston Properties do any modeling and have they perceived that there would be any impact in with office workers lining up on the sidewalk? Uh, not, not that we're aware of. Um, and, and I think I can probably answer both of your, your questions or comments there with, with the same uh, answer. Uh, what, what is being shown here is, is a maximum extent uh, of the waiver being requested. Uh, and that applies to the length of the lobby. So the, the outer red line there, as well as the recess that is being proposed. So uh, what they're trying to do there is, is build in as much flexibility for whatever those future outcomes of, of queuing and, and screening and, and temperature checking and things that might be necessary. Because um, I, I mean, I think that they would probably agree with you that there probably will be an amount of sidewalk um, queuing to, done here, but uh, that is probably also not possible in uh, perhaps the colder months. Uh, and if they can accommodate that within uh, their lobby space, then uh, I think they probably see that as ideal. So uh, I think we definitely acknowledge that there's a balance to be struck here between providing enough flexibility in the lobby space, um, but also activating with enough retail. Um, and I think, you know, as those studies um, progress, um, such as the one from Arab that you're mentioning, uh, I think there is room to take on board recommendations like that as the proposal, um, you know, progresses into more of a level of detailed design uh, instead of uh, what is, you know, not illustrative, but is, is, you know, not far off illustrative here, just to sort of show how the, the different components of the floor of the, the floor plate at ground level will, will sort of fit in amongst each other. So, um, to, to your retail comment, uh, certainly I would, I would agree that, you know, the corner down on 44th and Madison there is, is a small spot. Um, that is the smallest it would possibly be uh, and is possibly not what will turn out because it, it would be, could be larger than that based upon this being the maximum extent of lobby waiver that is being requested. So uh, that's something that they can sort of finesse um, further, further down the track as the design um, evolves. Yeah. I mean, they must be concerned about it themselves because to the extent that you're trying to entice people back into office life, um, you know, standing waiting for the elevator for an hour and a half is not going to encourage them. You know? So it's definitely, it's definitely an issue. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, they talk about their energy uh, performance and so on and so forth. And I have two sort of comments about that. And it's not necessarily the purview of this commission, but um, so much of energy performance is dependent on the fit up of the building. So you can say all you like about lead performance, but if the, uh, in the core and shell, but if the fit up doesn't carry that through, then it all goes to pot. And I wonder, uh, are Boston properties doing their own fit up or how do they impose the energy standards on, on the tenants that they, they lease to? And second of all, you know, we talk about decarbonizing our construction, but yet again, here is another glass curtain wall building, which is which struggles to meet energy standards and, and, to, and to achieve decarbonization, but both in the production of glass and steel and concrete and in the performance of that under thermal, thermal load. So, I mean, I know it's not our job to opine on these things, but it seems to me this design of this building is very much uh, a product of the last decade and not the future decades. There is an, an amount of materials in your in your package that talk to the sustainability detail that they have uh, at the moment. So uh, I, I probably need to refer you to some of that. And so, you know, for your other comments, um, we can certainly talk to you about those when it when it comes back. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, to the extent of what the finding requires um, is is what they've been able to speak to at this point. And um, I, I mean, I think even just in comparison to a very recent 
uh, development developed under the same text at, at one Vanderbilt. Um, that there is comparison, sort of the, the slide that, that I brought up before, that the side-by-side com -side comparison is that you know, we are moving in the right direction here. Uh, and this is actually subject to, to greater uh, sustainability performance regulations than even the most recent developments in the area. So um, certainly take your points, uh, but I think we're going in the right direction as well. Well, I'm going to take this up further with Vice Chair Knuckles uh, at his cocktail party, so thank you. Other questions from commissioners? Okay, then this application is certified. Okay, uh, the item number four is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Staten Island Community District 1. Our presenter is Joseph Halferty, and I want to confirm that Commissioner Cirillo is back on. Yes. I am now. Thank you Excellent. so much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Got the text. Thank you. Joe? Great. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, the following application has been submitted by Richmond SI Owners LLC uh, seeking a zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment, and special permit to facilitate a mixed use development comprised of 750 residential units, 18,800 square feet of commercial use, uh, located in the St. George neighborhood on the north shore of Staten Island. Next slide, please. The project area outlined here in red is currently zoned R6 C22 and is located in the center of the St. George neighborhood and surrounded by much of the North Shore's recent uh, city initiated planning and development activity. Uh, immediately to the east of the site is the location of the New York Wheel, Richmond County Ballpark and Empire Outlets. Approximately one quarter mile southeast of the site is the Staten Island Ferry Terminal, which is the primary hub of public transit in the borough, providing access to MTA bus service, the Staten Island Railway, uh, ferry service to Manhattan, as well as additional ferry service as part of the New York City Ferry Program, uh, which will be going to Midtown, which is expected to begin later this year. Uh, approximately one mile south of the project area is the Special Bay Street Quarter District, adopted in 2018, and the Special Stapleton Waterfront District, adopted in 2006. As part of these various efforts, the community will soon be served by several miles of waterfront open space and other recreational activities. Uh, next slide, please. The project area is located on the northern boundary of the Special Hillsides Preservation District uh, and sharing its southern and eastern boundaries with the Special St. George District. To the north and east of the site is zoned M11 and is the location of the aforementioned city initiated projects such as the Wheel, Ballpark and Outlets. To the south of the project area lies a C42 district that is the core of the St. George Civic Center, uh, home to a mix of residential and commercial uses, as well as multiple public facilities such as Staten Island Borough Hall and various courthouse functions. And to the west of the site lies a mix of R3 and R4 districts located within the Special Hillsides Preservation District, and um, that's comprised predominantly of one and two family detached homes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the application implicates both the Special Hillsides Preservation District and St. George District. Uh, Hillsides was initially mapped in 1987 and mirrors similar provisions established the previous decade in the Special Natural Area District uh, in the mid-island of Staten Island. Uh, it was established to put in place zoning that was intended to preserve areas of steep, st steep slope, pardon me, uh, specifically along the Serpentine Ridge and preserve the unique aesthetic value of hillside neighborhoods. Uh, the district achieved this through the use of CPC authorizations, strict use and bulk controls and planting requirements. Uh, Hillsides is primarily mapped in lower density districts throughout the borough, uh, and the vast majority of the special district covers R1 through R3 districts, uh, as well as many of the regulations being tailored to that lower density context. Um, the special district itself, as it lies today, uh, includes only two blocks that are zoned R6, uh, one of which includes the development site. Conversely, the special St. George district was created in 2008 to grow the St. George neighborhood as a civic center and transit hub of the borough by implementing regulations to encourage development that would attract the critical mass of workers and residents to the area, as well as create a more pedestrian friendly environment. Uh, unique to the St. George special district are bulk controls that permit taller, slender buildings up to 200 feet in height on uh, larger C42 zoned sites um, and capitalize on the neighborhood's unique hillside topography uh, and views of New York Harbor. Next slide, please. 
The project area outlined in the red dashed line is located along Richmond Terrace, Stuyvesant Place, uh, Hamilton Avenue, and Nicholas Street. Uh, the project area consists of seven tax lots and three partial tax lots located on Block 13, and one tax lot that comprises all of Block 12, uh, which is the rectangular parcel uh, east of the development site. Um, this also includes uh, several one and two family buildings located um, along Richmond Terrace and Hamilton Avenue, as well as an existing 11 story mixed use building located at the corner of Richmond Terrace and Nicholas Street. Included in the project area is a portion of Block 13, Lot 8, which is known as the Castleton Park Apartments, uh, which are currently the tallest buildings in the borough and are approximately 200 feet in height uh, from the elevation of St. Mark's Place, you know, uphill of the development site. Uh, next slide, please. So shown here in aerial view, you can better see the relationship between the development site and the adjacent context uh, and the unique hillside topography. Um, so this includes this mixture of lower density detached housing, uh, both to the, to the north and to the west of the site, um, as well as the medium density residential developments uh, located within the St. George Special District today, and the higher density Castleton Park apartments located adjacent to this uh, development site's rear lot line. Next slide, please. The development site shown here outlined in red is approximately 97,000 square feet of zoning lot, and that's excluding approximately 1,660 feet uh, that's located within the bed of the mapped Stuyvesant Place. Uh, the development site is bound by approximately 704 feet of frontage on Richmond Terrace and Stuyvesant Place, and 133 feet of frontage along Hamilton Avenue. The site slopes steeply upward from the front lot line towards the Castleton Park apartments to the rear, and that's between 32 and 34 feet in grade change you know, throughout the site. Uh, the panhandle portion of the uh, Castleton Park uh, apartments that we previously mentioned uh, extends from the upland lot to Richmond Terrace, and it contains a sewer easement, which is shown here in blue uh, that bisects the site. Next slide, please. Uh, so the proposed development seeks to construct three mixed-use buildings totaling approximately 592,000 square feet of floor area to achieve a 6.0 FAR on the site. The development would contain approximately 750 housing units, up to 225 of which would be permanently affordable, um, and 18,800 square feet of commercial space. The three buildings are framed by a series of open spaces, including a public open space at the intersection of Stuyvesant Place and Hamilton Avenue, and two additional private open spaces between the remaining buildings. The applicant states that the intention of these open spaces is to allow for the characteristics of the hillside topography to flow through the site uh, and to meet the intent of the district of the St. George Special District by allowing the hillside character to be visible from the street. The buildings themselves range in height from 26 to 11 stories with a variety of setbacks at several levels. And again, the applicant states that this development is designed and oriented in such a way as to provide uh, more narrow towers that may maintain views uh, toward the harbor and from upland neighborhoods, uh, including Hamilton Avenue, um, again, aligning with the intent of the special district. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so building one, located at the south of the development site, at the corner of Stuyvesant Place and Hamilton Avenue, rises to a height of approximately 273 feet, or 26 stories, and is proposed to contain 327 dwelling units, uh, 9,637 square feet of commercial floor area, and 215 parking spaces located in both the cellar levels as well as above the first story. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, building two, which is located at the center of the site, uh, rises to a height of approximately 245 feet or 25 stories, uh, and is proposed to contain 295 dwelling units uh, and 1,715 square feet of commercial floor area. Uh, building two will be connected below grade to building three to the north to provide access to the uh, parking levels. And next slide, please. And building three at the northernmost edge of the development site uh, rises to a height of 132 feet or 11 stories, and is pr proposed to contain 128 dwelling units, 7,468 square feet of commercial floor area, and 116 parking spaces. Uh, next slide, please. The three buildings as shown here uh, in elevation along Stuyvesant Place and Richmond Terrace are designed to provide a consistent base height amongst these three towers, but provide a varied range in height and setback uh, to allow for the development to respond to the adjacent context as well as preserve views from the public realm. So building one, which is to the left here, is the 26 story tower, uh, which provides a number of setbacks away from Hamilton Avenue to preserve upland views as well as light and air at the street level. 
Uh, this portion of the lot is closest to the existing St. George Special District boundary, uh, where the building heights today are permitted up to 20 stories as of right on those larger C42 uh, zoned lots. Building two, located at the center, uh, is the narrowest tower and also begins to step down the height throughout the site um, you know, for, throughout the overall development. Um, so the height of both buildings one and two respond directly to the context of the Castleton Park apartments to the rear. And building three on the right, proposed at 11 stories, uh, is designed to respond to the context of the existing 11 story building north of the development site at the corner of Richmond Terrace and Nicholas Street. Uh, next slide, please. So the development is anchored by an approximately 7,790 square foot public open space located at the corner of Stuyvesant Place and Hamilton Avenue. Uh, so this is adjacent to building one's entrance to its commercial uses of the ground floor. Uh, the open space is designed to negotiate the steep grade changes within the site as well as on the adjoining uh, streets and sidewalks. So to achieve this, uh, there are two primary levels to the open space connected at the center by a small stair and multiple access points between the sidewalk and the public open space, the largest of which is located at the same elevation as the building's commercial entrances at the center of the uh, public open space. Next slide, please. Uh, so this, this rendering here better demonstrates how this open space is responding to the various grade changes, both along uh, Hamilton Avenue as well as Stuyvesant Place, um, as well as how it relates to the commercial areas entrances um, and generally tries to maintain some of the planting, um, you know, the planting requirements that are you know, typically known throughout the Hillsides District. Next slide, please. So the following slides demonstrate how the proposed building massings relate to the surrounding context. So in the upper image, you can see the buildings in elevation looking west. Uh, in dark gray is the proposed development. And beyond that in lighter gray lie the Castleton Park apartments. Uh, similarly in the lower image um, from Hamilton Avenue looking north, it demonstrates the substantial change in grade between Stuyvesant Place and Richmond Terrace, uh, and then further uphill at St. Mark's Place, um, and how that impacts the height of the proposed development comparatively to the Castleton Park apartments. So in this case, you can see the maximum height of the tallest proposed building is effectively aligned with the height of the bulkhead from the, the Castleton Park apartments. Next slide, please. So this view uh, from Richmond Terrace looking south demonstrates the base heights of the proposed development uh, and how it maintains an approximately 40 foot height, which is aligned with what is permitted uh, in the special St. George district today for developments that are seeking to build within the tower provisions uh, that are allowed within the district as of right. Next slide, please. And the following aerial view looking south demonstrates the relative height of the proposed buildings as they relate to the Castleton Park apartments, as well as to the 11 story mixed use building uh, previously mentioned uh, the north in the project area. Uh, in the foreground of the image, you can also see the site of the New York wheel and the constructed parking garage that exists there today. Next slide, please. And then lastly uh, is an aerial view looking west, which demonstrates the building's varied height and setbacks, uh, as well as the open spaces, uh, which show that hillside characteristic flowing from the uh, rear lot line towards the street on uh, Stuyvesant Place and, and Richmond Terrace. And again, the relationship to the Castleton Park Apartments to the rear. So to facilitate this development, the applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment, and special permit. Uh, next slide, please. So first, the zoning map amendment would seek to rezone the project area from R6 C22 within the Hillside Special District uh, to R7 C24 within the St. George uh, Special District. Uh, additionally, block 12, that triangular parcel I mentioned before, is proposed to be rezoned from R6 C22 uh, to R6 C24, also within the St. George Special District. Next slide, please. Second, the applicant seeks to amend the special St. George district and article two of the zoning resolution to allow for the R73 district and optional quality housing regulations to be permitted within the special St. George district. Uh, St. George text amendment would align the underlying R73 district regulations with other areas in the city where it is mapped, uh, as well as create a new bulk special permit. Additionally, the text amendment would seek to amend Appendix F and establish the rezoning area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area, and the applicant intends to establish both options one and two. Uh, next slide, please. 
And lastly, the applicant is seeking uh, the proposed bulk special permit applicable to our seven districts within the special St. George district. The special permit would allow for bulk modifications and waivers of the district's mandatory improvements if the proposed development meets the following findings of aiding and achieving the general purpose and intent of the district, uh, enhancing the distribution of bulk on the zoning lot, uh, not unduly obstructing access to light and air from surrounding streets and properties, and generally resulting in a better site plan and urban design relationships uh, with the adjacent streets, open areas, and surrounding neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. So each building is seeking a variety of waivers to respond to the irregular shape of the zoning lot and to the adjacent context. These waivers would include building height, setback, rooftop regulations, rear yard requirements, and planting requirements uh, from the special district. And the following slides will outline how each of these apply to the proposed development. Next slide, please. So building one is seeking a total of three bulk waivers including a height waiver of 88 feet or eight and a half stories uh, above the 180 foot five, uh, 85 foot maximum height for an R73 district. So that waiver here is shown in red. Uh, a setback waiver to reduce the 15 foot setback by a minimum of a maximum of 9.3 feet to respond to the curved front lot line along Stuyvesant Place, which is shown here in blue, and a rear yard reduction for an approximately 95 square foot portion of the building's footprint, uh, which is highlighted in red in the plan on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen uh, to respond to the irregular side and rear lot line conditions of the development site. Next slide, please. Uh, building two is seeking a total of two bulk waivers including a height waiver of 60 feet or six stories above the 180 foot five maximum height, as well as a setback waiver for a small portion uh, highlighted here in blue on the lower left-hand side uh, to reduce the 10 foot setback from Richmond Terrace by a maximum of five feet to respond to the curved nature of the front lot line. Uh, building two is also seeking a waiver of rooftop regulations to allow for the bulkhead to exceed 20%, uh, in this case, up to 38% of the building's total lot coverage. Next slide, please. And lastly, building three is seeking one bulk waiver for setback along Richmond Terrace uh, to allow for a portion of the 11 story building uh, to be with, located within the 10 foot setback from Richmond Terrace, which is a wide street uh, by a maximum of three feet. Uh, and this is to allow for an adequate building depth to be provided at this portion of the zoning lot, which is the, the shallowest portion of the lot. Uh, next slide, please. Pardon me, uh, back one slide to 26. Thank you. Um, and finally, the application is seeking to waive the special district mandatory improvement requirements for planting. Uh, so the special district requires that the entire area between the street wall and the street line be planted. And the applicant proposes a waiver, which would allow for the development of several of the site's features, such as the public open space, um, areas of sidewalk widening adjacent to building entrances, as well as uh, pathways and some seating to be located within private open spaces uh, that are dividing the buildings. Next slide, please. So a notice of completion for the draft environmental impact statement uh, was issued earlier today, May 3rd, and the DEIS identified significant adverse, uh, the potential for significant adverse impacts with effects to op active open space, uh, traffic, as well as construction, traffic, and noise. Uh, no other significant adverse impacts were identified, and mitigations are identified in the DEIS and continue to be explored further into the uh, FEIS. Next slide, please. So in summary, the proposed development is seeking a zoning map amendment, text amendment, and special permit to facilitate the development of three mixed use buildings that will provide a total of 750 housing units, over 18,000 square feet of commercial floor area, and a 7,990 square foot public open space in the St. George neighborhood of Staten Island. Uh, so thank you very much, commissioners, and I'm happy to take any questions. And I see that Commissioner Capelli has his hand. Uh, yeah, I, this might seem like a uh, trivial uh, recommendation but for one uh, I would take off referring to the uh, ballpark as the Staten Island Yankee ballpark since they've since left town and uh, you'll hear about it uh, in perpetuity if you leave it in and when you send it to the community boards and the local public officials. Uh, the uh, second thing is that uh, 
referring to the side of the wheel. Uh, you know, that's somewhat wishful thinking at this point. So you know, there might be a more delicate way uh, to uh, refer to that. Uh, so uh, this is going to be a very contentious uh, local matter. Uh, there's going to be uh, probably a lot of opposition from the community board, from the public officials, and we need need to make it look like city planning is a, in is in touch with the community uh, as it exists as we go forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Local context matters, and um, the way we refer to things matters. So appreciate that context, Commissioner Cirillo. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Joe, I I'm glad to see you got another easy one throw you thrown your way. Um, for the island, but as usual, you did an excellent job in describing the project to us. Um, and I, I just, I will join with, with my colleague, Commissioner Capelli in just outlining what is likely known that this is um, already uh, somewhat contentious and, and sort of hot, hot issue. Um, and I realize this is the beginning of public review. So it'll be really interesting to see uh, what input we receive through that process. Um, but uh, just a few things at this point in time um, that I'd just like to kind of raise or, or just get some direction or, or answers on, Joe, if you would. Um, there's no particular order in this because my notes are a mess, but um, I'll, I'll start with what I see at the top circled, and that's the DEIS. Um, that obviously, if it was, it just, you just received notice of completion today. Um, we, we have not seen that is, will that be, will we, will we see something that we can review at some point? Um, obviously there'll be in information in there that will be helpful as we continue through this process ourselves, Never mind getting feedback from the public. Yes, um, we, we will be circulating the DIS. Um, it, it it was released today, so yeah, okay. we'll, get it, we'll get it out to you guys. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. You know, I don't. We, we didn't have the opportunity yep. even to just kind of skim it to have a sense of some of the issues that might be raised at this point, for the record. But um, I'll look forward to to doing that when it, when it comes. So I guess the big the big sort of picture issue, and I realize this is a private application and, and not the administration's application, um, is this what and I and I do want to say for the record that the design of this project is is quite beautiful in terms of what it, what it brings. The issue that has been the the contentious issue to use. Uh, Commissioner Capelli's word is is about the height of this. Now there could be other other issues that we haven't gotten to yet because we didn't you know see the project in this to this degree. But the real big one is about introducing R seven to Staten Island. Never mind to the North Shore in this point. And I know some could argue that if you're going to do it, this is the place to do it. The but it doesn't remove the question of what, what, why are you doing it? And so I guess, what, would there be a sense of what this project could be if it was designed within sort of the R6 St. George Special District rules? I mean, even with the rezoning, there's waivers for eight stories on the first building, six stories on the second building. You know, what if, what if the buildings were built at an R6? What, what would we lose versus what we would gain in terms of finding greater support perhaps in the community? Great. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. Um, regarding the specifics of, of what could be built under an R6, um, I would just say that today the site lies in the Hillside Special District. Uh, and since it does contain steep slope, um, effectively any development on that site would require authorization by the commission. Um, you may remember in, I believe it was 2008, there was a previous application uh, for this site that sought those uh, types of authorizations. 
um, that was ultimately referred to the community board um, and unfortunately didn't make it back to the commission for reasons outside of my understanding. Um, the community board was uh, in support of the application at the time and it sought to provide, uh, I believe it was two 20, two 20 story towers over a uh, low, uh, a low base for the site. Um, that said, uh, I think to the core of your question about, you know, what if the site were to stay in the St. George Special District but be designed under the R6, I'd, I'd have to um, defer to um, both either our urban designers or uh, the applicant themselves to be able okay. to provide a more realistic expectation of that. Well, I understand, I, and I appreciate that response. I, I was just, you know, that's, that's one issue that sort of hangs over this process and, and it has to do with, with the height. Um, so I, and it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a test, so I appreciate the response and I guess maybe maybe we'll learn more about that as the public review is underway. Um, the, the other question that I had was about uh, two, two questions. The, re, the retail component, um, what, what is exactly envisioned there? I mean, I, I asked the question because, you know, right across the street is, or, or the Empire Outlets, and I, I, um, I just wondered what either complement or uh, conflict there are there may be with an incredible amount of retail in the same exact location at, at particularly at this at this point in time, understanding that if this were approved, it would be you know, years ahead before it was actually realized. But I, I just didn't know, and maybe the DEIS has that again, maybe that's a, something that's addressed there that I could learn more from, but I just wondered if you had any take on that. So um, uh, unlike the Empire Outlets, which as you know, are providing a more regional destination kind of retail environment, primarily dry goods, but the applicant has stated that this, this application is more likely to um, facilitate retail that serves the local community. Um, as I know you're familiar with, much of Stuyvesant Place uh, and portions of Richmond Terrace opposite the Empire Outlets do have a kind of smaller format yes. uh, retail setting and uh, they really serve most of the kind of working population of folks who are coming to St. George on a day to day. Um, there are no particular tenants obviously lined up for this uh, retail, but it is not thought to be, or not planned to be uh, trying to compete with these larger uh, destination retail uses that are uh, adjacent. Okay, and, and just la last question, at least at, at this round is, you mentioned the triangle. If I, I don't know if the, the rendering uh, or the slides are still available, but the sort of the, the one where you see the buildings with the triangle, we'll call it the triangle, it's Stuyvesant and Richmond Terrace. Um, I think in your explanation later on toward, toward the end, you talked about that being a part of the rezoning area in a rezoning of the triangle. Is, is the triangle under the same ownership of as the applicant or is that a different owner? I, I, I don't recall that that was the same ownership. Right, so the, the triangular parcel or block 12 is under different ownership um, and is ultimately you know, included in this application as it was uh, kind of already wrapped by the St. George Special District on, on two sides. So by including the development site and the majority of block 13 within that special district, it effectively would have left an, an island of um, you know, a, a piece of land that was not incorporated into any of these surrounding special districts. Um, however, there are, you know, certain provisions of this special district that, you know, could be beneficial to the development of this site, but these actions do not propose to increase the development potential of that site, uh, residential or commercial floor areas. Uh, it really just reduces the um, commercial parking requirement to align it with the you know, surrounding block. Um, as well as, you know, make optional uh, quality housing and the provisions of St. George. Okay, yeah, I was just concerned about what what that might do to the lot and the future development of the lot and how that obviously, you know, we're not focused on that piece, but yet whether or not it had an impact in the future that both for Richmond Terrace and Stuyvesant and then even for this applicant, um, wherever this, this, this uh, application goes and what impact it would have. But you mentioned something uh, about about parking, and, and and again, it's not clear to me um, where the 
access points for the parking are in these buildings. Um, you know, Stuyvesant Place is not proposed to be widened here. It doesn't seem like it anyway. It looks like it's remaining sort of as at its existing map width, which is we we those of us who know Stuyvesant know it's not a, it's an it's a you know relatively narrow street. So I'm just wondering how people under this plan would access the parking in the buildings and where that is and how that will function and interact with the flow of traffic on Richmond Terrace and um, and on Stuyvesant. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, pr production, if you can pull the slides up again, can you please go to slide seven? Um, so Commissioner, to your first point, um, Regarding widening, I mentioned that there is a approximately 16 or 1700 square foot portion of uh, Stuyvesant Place or of this zoning lot that's located within the bed of Stuyvesant Place. Um, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that blue portion here. So that would be uh, in, improved. However, as you're correct, Stuyvesant Place is still uh, quite a narrow street. However, this would allow for um, a more regularized parking and uh, sidewalk um, condition along this part of the lot. But then uh, production, if you can go to the next slide, slide eight. That's also um, where the public public improvements, the, the, okay, here we go, yes. Right, so you can begin to see it a bit here in front of building one. Um, however, I'd like to just point out the entrances uh, to, to parking. So only buildings one and three have parking located within their footprint. So for building three, uh, there is a curb cut at the northern edge of that building um, almost at the end of the lot line. So that would be providing a curb cut off of Richmond Terrace. And then for building one, there's actually two curb cuts. So due to the steep topography of the site, um, there is the opportunity to provide both, you know, parking at, at lower levels as well as, um, you know, at above the first story. So there is a one curb cut located uh, kind of immediately next to the, uh, areas that are shown as like residential entrances on, on Stuyvesant Place. You can, you can see it as a small break in the street trees in this drawing. Um, and then there's an additional curb cut on Hamilton Avenue, um, kind of right next to where it says Hamilton. Um, so that curb cut would be able to provide parking actually to the upper stories uh, without the need for any ramps or uh, you know, more uh, space consuming measures on the inside of the building. So that would be above the first story. So it, the, the curb cuts, in, in a way, wrap the public open space. I mean, at the at each end, one one on Stuyvesant and one on Hamilton. But as people may be accessing the public space, they would be crossing curb cuts at each end, depending on which direction they were coming from. Uh, depending on direction, I suppose. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank thank you. I'll 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 pass this along to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I'll, more to come. Thank you. I think I'm up next. Joe, could you put that slide eight uh, back again? So I had a question about the about the open spaces. Um, and I, is the open space, the public open space at building one, is that a POPs and subject to POPs design uh, guidelines and regulations? Um, it's, it's not a POPs as, you know, we would define through the zoning resolution in that it's not ameliorating the floor area. Uh, however, it is it would be considered POPs under the expanded definition by city council. Um, so you know, this, this, the design of this public space does not have any particular requirements. Um, however, working with our urban designers, um, we did try and use some of the standards for uh, you know, conventional POPs, such as um, types of seating, types of lighting, uh, to ensure that the applicant would incorporate them into this space. But it could be reversed and made private at any point in that case, right? Uh, no, this, this space through the special permit would, would be required as public open space. Um, so I'm a bit confused then, why wouldn't it be a POPs then? It's, it's just not a, not a POPs as uh, defined in zoning, but only through the expanded definition of, of city council. No, I understand what you're saying. My question is why, why it wouldn't fall under the POPs regulations completely? So um, perhaps I can clarify. So the, the POPs program is a sort of um, incentive program where there's you know, floor area bonus open mm -hmm. space, right? So that's, that's a POPs, right? By the way we define it here. There are many other um, open space 
that, that we create through zoning. And one of them is through the special permits like this, where we would require an open space to be open and usable by the public. And in, in the city council defines that as a, a POPs, um, which is something of a loose, I guess a looser term, but it would, it through um, the uh, restrictive deck, it would be open and uh, available to the public. And there, are, and we can impose design requirements through mm -hmm. that mechanism. And but, do we get the little plaque on the wall telling the public that it's open and so on? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, that's my point. And, and the, the, in building one, is the retail there anticipated to be a restaurant or? Um, it's, it's unclear what the retail uses will, will be at this time, but um, as was I pointed out earlier, the entrance to building one's uh, commercial spaces are through this public open space. Right, right, okay. Uh, and the other two open spaces, they're, they're private, so there would be no public access to those spaces, and, and what do they envisage the use of those spaces to mean? Uh, yeah, that, that's correct. They would be private open spaces. Um, I know as, as of now, as the applicants indicated, that those spaces would really be used to allow for residents to move you know, between buildings or provide some additional amenities. However, the design of those particular aspects of the site plan, the, the private open spaces, are not um, something that would be you know, locked in by this special permit. So there is a bit of flexibility on how the applicant um, provides the design of, of those areas. And, and they would be maintained by some sort of condominium um, entity that would be responsible for maintenance? Uh, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't see other hands raised. And so with that, this application is certified. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, the uh, fifth item on the agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment, along with a referral of authorizations in Staten Island Community District 1 and our presenter is Barry Fisher. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, go to the next slide, please. This is a private application for a zoning map amendment from R32 and R3X to R6B with an extension of an existing C13 overlay. A zoning text amendment to design, designate an MIH area and commission authorizations for development in, in the Special Hillsides Preservation District. These actions would facilitate construction of a mixed use building with 46 dwelling units, of which 12 would be affordable, a daycare facility and a commercial storefront. The site is located in a, uh, at 252 Victory Boulevard in the Tompkinsville neighborhood of Staten Island, Community District 1. Victory Boulevard is a mixed use corridor connecting St. George to the West Shore and is an important thoroughfare for traveling to and from the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Victory Boulevard also forms the northern boundary of the Special Bay Street Corridor District a half mile to the east of the subject site. That plan was adopted two years ago to implement a neighborhood plan which sought to create additional housing opportunities in the North Shore, including affordable housing. The Tompkinsville Town Center effectively connects Bay Street with the subject site as part of the Bay Street rezoning process, the uh, Disposition Authority and UDAP was granted to HBD, HPD for an existing Department of Sanitation facility located across Victory Boulevard from the site at Jersey Street to facilitate future affordable housing. Jersey Street is another mixed use corridor that was identified as, as a retail corridor to revitalize in a separate North Shore 2030 planning study released by EDC and the department in 2011. The entire project area is in the Special Hillsides Preservation District, which regulates preservation of natural features in order to achieve district goals, which include preventing erosion and preserving the aesthetic value of the hillsides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Most nearby existing buildings along the opposite side of Victory Boulevard from the site are residential in use. Adjacent sites to the south are vacant and steep and, sto and slope, sorry, slope steeply up from Victory Boulevard. Next slide, next slide, please. 
To the north of this site and catty corner across from the street is the sanitation garage in the upper right corner, which I mentioned and is slated for affordable housing by HPD once the garage function relocates to a new facility in Fresh Kills. A public stairway borders the northern edge of the project area across from Jersey Street. Surrounding uses are mostly residential ranging from single family to six story multifamily and some houses of worship. Next slide, please. The project area is served by five bus routes that all provide access to the ferry terminal and is located on the south side of Victory Boulevard and is split between R32 and R3X districts. There is a continuous area of hillside steep slope which had previously been disturbed. All lots in the project area are vacant except for an auto repair facility in the northern cord corner of the project area. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes to develop a 63,000 square foot uh, mixed use building, which would equate to an FAR of 2.12. It contains roughly 55,000 square feet of residential floor area, 7,500 square feet of commercial, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, community facility use for a daycare and roughly 1,200 square feet of commercial floor area. The building would rise to a maximum average height of 54 feet above natural grade or five stories and consists of 46 dwelling units, 34 at market rate and 12 affordable through MIH option one and two. The proposed development would have a lot coverage of approximately 50% preserve or replant the remainder of the site. 59 accessory parking spaces would be provided and made accessible via, by two new curb cuts along Victory Boulevard. No parking is required for the daycare and commercial space uh, waves from parking due to its small size. While only 20 parking spaces are required for residences, the applicant is electing to provide additional parking spaces of which four could be used as a pickup and drop off for the proposed daycare. The parking will be divided between the first floor, which is shown here and the cellar level. Next slide, please. The base height averages 30 feet high to align with the surrounding home height. With each of the top three floors stepping back above the base, a common amenity is proposed for the roof and green roof elements are proposed on the roof and for each tier of the upper three floors. Next slide, please. The applicant requests the following actions to facilitate the proposed development. Mm -hmm. The zoning map amendment to rezone most of the project area from R32 and R3X districts to an R6B district and to extend the existing C13 commercial overlay across the entire Victory Boulevard frontage. Excuse me. These map amendments would promote commercial uses along this stretch of Victory Boulevard and at this major intersection of Victory Boulevard and Jersey Street. Next slide. The applicant requests a CPC authorization uh, under the Hillside Special District to disturb sleep, steep slope, which accommodates the building footprint. Now, in order to blend in with the natural topography, the building would employ three setbacks to mimic the rising topography of the site at the third, fourth, and fifth floors. Furthermore, 39% of the site would be preserved as an area of no disturbance and 46% of, of the rooftop area would be planted to be visible from the street below. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. An additional hillside authorization is required to permit a community facility use in a residence district and for any group parking facility of 30 or more parking spaces. The daycare use will serve area residents, area residents, and the parking is consolidated in the building to avoid disturbance to natural features. The applicant also proposes a text amendment to designate an MIH area under options one and two to require permanent permanently affordable dwellings on the development site and two adjacent parcels. In summary, these requested land use actions would facilitate a mixed use building that includes new permanently affordable housing, a daycare facility, 
and commercial space at this major intersection in Staten Island's North Shore. Excuse me. I uh, thank you, commissioners, and would be happy to answer any questions. And um, before turning it over for questioning, I'll note that this is a red letter day to our knowledge. This is the first time that Staten Island has had two projects going through Euler at the same time. Commissioner Cerullo. Uh, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, lucky me. Um, let me just say uh, thank you, um, Barry, for that, uh, for the presentation. A couple of questions just in, in terms of trying to see into the, in, into the building somewhat. Um, obviously, when you look at the exterior design um, and assuming that this is what we would see upon an approval, um, are, the, are the roofs, the, the roofs, are they nearly green roofs for design purposes, or are they access points for the residents or visitors or anything? What 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 can we what do we know about? You, you use the term terrace, but I see terraces on the front of the building. I don't know if what's on the roof is a terrace or that's just a, a green roof. Okay, if uh, production could go back to the uh, floor plan, please. Uh, that's okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's good. Uh, so the, uh, there's a roof that is usable. Uh, it would have an amenity, uh, which they label as a recreation area here. So, which would be accessible from, uh, within the building. You can see it has an elevator and stair access. Uh, and uh, it would largely be uh, planted and have solar panels. Uh, the lower terraces also include planted areas, uh, which are shown by the patterns. Uh, the applicant can speak more to this at the public hearing. Uh, at this point, uh, the, the, the terraces are part of the um, uh, claim that the applicant is making that findings would be met to uh, have the building blend into the hillsides. Uh, so they would be required, but uh, you can talk with the applicant more at the public hearing about how they would, uh, you know, how they would function. Sure. I guess I was just uh, trying to figure out, um, obviously on that, on the sort of front page rendering of the building, I, I saw both terraces or they look like terraces on the building but then you see like um they're clearly terraces there which i'm assuming are part of the residential units i just couldn't tell what's above so if you're saying there is a rooftop area i didn't know if that was ex if if one you were able to it was beyond just beautification and design and perhaps sustainability if it was for the residents, or you mentioned the potential of the daycare, um, and if that was part of the potential use of for the daycare as well. So I guess we'll we'll learn more about that as as it comes through. Um, if we just keep this rendering on, I, can you explain what what? There's two questions that come to mind from this here, which is the access to the different portions of the building. And um, perhaps we're not seeing all of it perfectly here, but there's a residential component, there's um, a commercial component, and and then I guess there's the community facility component. Where is everybody coming in this main walkway in the front? What what what's happening to get to those mm -hmm. different places? Is there interaction between them or? or people who live there crisscrossing with children in daycare. And I mean, it's a small commercial uh, space. So I'm assuming that's, you know, whatever that's for, it's not very large. It could be supporting perhaps the daycare or something else that's going on there. All uh, right, yes, you are right. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, where the two people are illustrated on this uh, rendering, is uh, where the uh, people would step off from the sidewalk 
into either the uh, retail space, the daycare, or the uh, the residential lobby, which are three separate doorways um, uh, on the front of the building. Uh, since this uh, street does slope uh, a lot, it's, it slopes over um, you know, almost 20 feet from uh, from side from one side of the lot to the other. I uh, the, uh, the the people are shown there at a place where where they would step off the sidewalk and go to a level uh, um, porch area, if you will, uh, a level apron to uh, access the three different uses. So there will be three doors for the three uses side by side, we'll say, like uh, in a row? Uh, spreading across the middle portion of the building. Um, if, if you could uh, go back to the floor plan, please. Uh, that shows the, um, yes, that one. Uh, you, you can oh, see I, how, yeah. how the three doorways are uh, distributed um, in, this, in this front apron. I got it. Okay, thank you. And then I guess the last uh, question at this point has to do with the parking. It, it, mm -hmm. It looks like, and if you go back to that first rendering, which is, I guess, quite helpful to these questions, mm -hmm. uh, but it is hard to see. Obviously, the the ramp and and curb cut that's most obvious in, in right in front of us with the vehicle coming out of it um, is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell is if by where the people are and that little ramp that would bring you to the entrance ways. Is that also a curb cut ramp or is that just a curb cut? Because I can't tell if there's a secondary, is, is it is the, the garage for, for these units all, uh, is it, I guess the question is, is there an in and an out? Um, because, you know, if, how, how that works and, and whether the parking is expected to be linked to a unit or is it, open parking so that people who live there and then people who might be bringing their children in or going to the commercial space would also be pulling in to this lot and how is that configured? Well, from the information that uh, we have, the uh, elevator would connect uh, the, the two different parking levels. Each of these uh, curb cuts, one, one that you see clearly on the left and, and the, the, the one that's uh, to the right of the people where you see uh, some shadow uh, effect of, 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 a, of a curb cut is, is, the, is the other curb cut um, for the parking that's located on the first floor. Uh, so, so the elevator would connect them. The applicant uh, could certainly um, respond to questions as to how the, the residential spaces are, are distributed. Um, um, Okay. At this point, you know, it, it's just it's just four uh, spaces that they identify on the first floor that could be used as a pickup and drop off, uh, uh, and and that's to, to yeah. I just I'm space. trying to get a sense of if you pull in, then how do you pull out? Do you you know what what the size of it is, and is this a you know would someone who might be a visitor be able to access the building where residents live or vice versa. So I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea, which I'm sure the applicant will be prepared to explain when this comes back on the mm. operation of the garages and the interaction with the residential uh, portion of the building. And just one last final thing, looking at this, and I'm sure DOT will end up weighing in on this if they haven't already, but mm -hmm. the configuration of the street, it, it looks like it's, it's built, obviously part of it is being widened and part of it is not, but is that being built for parking or a drop off? Is that because there's a potential daycare center? What's happening in the car back? I or the neck down, this, whichever Yeah, way. yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, there isn't actually a neck down. Uh, their uh, model happens to have a, uh, a, a level area in it as an approximation. Um, uh, and again, the applicant can speak to this further, but the, the curb is uh, fairly continuous right now and there's no widening area 
uh, proposed at this point um, in, in the application. The applicant, again, you know, they can uh, talk uh, further if, okay. uh, you know. I, I just, I'd love to understand more about what that looks like and what it might actually be. But I, I appreciate that, Barry, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't see any other. And so this application is now certified. Thank you, commissioners. Okay. Uh, moving on to the sixth item on our agenda, it, which is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 8. Our presenter is Scott Solomon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, first day at the borough office. Uh, production, if you can move on to the second slide. So this is a private application by 18517 Hillside LLC, proposing a zoning map amendment for portions of five lots fronting the north side of Hillside Avenue between Dalney Road and Chelsea Street in the Jamaica Estates neighborhood of Queens Community District 8 in order to facilitate development of a nine-story mixed-use building containing approximately 48 dwelling units, 12 permanently affordable pursuant to MIH provisions, and a ground floor commercial space. In addition, a corresponding zoning text amendment is proposed to extend the boundaries of the special downtown Jamaica district to be coterminous with the project area, to enable MIH provisions within the special district, and to map an MIH area coterminous with the project area. Next slide, please. In 2007, the city sponsored Jamaica Plan Rezoning established the Special Downtown Jamaica District or DJ Special District, an inclusionary housing designated area within certain zoning districts. The rezoning encouraged both market rate and affordable housing production along major arterials, including Hillside Avenue, while also limiting development and established low density residential areas. East of the downtown Jamaica core, sites fronting on both the south and north side of Hillside Avenue, including the project area, were primarily rezoned to R6A, C24. Along Hillside Avenue, the uh, VIH or Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program is applicable to R7A and R7X districts and their commercial equivalents, but R6A districts were excluded from VIH designation. Uh, provisions of the DJ Special District included a building transition rule uh, within a 25 foot wide transition area abutting a lower density district, the maximum building height was capped at 35 feet. Additionally, new developments are required to provide an eight foot wide open area between the wall of a new building and a lot line that abuts a lower density district. Next slide. The surrounding area is characterized by a mix of land uses, including residential, commercial, and community facility uses, with one and two family homes along the side streets to the north and south of Hillside Avenue, and high density residential and community facility buildings and low density mixed use buildings fronting Hillside Avenue. Hillside Avenue is a multi-lane arterial with an east-west orientation that serves as a commercial corridor for the neighborhood. In addition to se two seven story residential buildings within the project area, the block immediately west contains a 12 story residential building, a 12 story long-term care facility and another seven story residential building. Uh, one block east of the project area includes another seven story residential building uh, low-rise residential and mixed-use buildings with ground floor commercial uses are located directly across the street from the project area. The zoning in the hills in the area includes the R6A, C24, and the coterminous DJ Special District along the Hillside Avenue corridor, R5 to the northwest, R41 to the uh, south of Hillside Avenue, and R3X to the north and southeast of Hillside Avenue. When the project area was rezoned in 2007, it preserved a split lot condition for each of the lots in the project area, while an R7A, located 1,000 feet west of the project area, was mapped at a depth that included the entirety of zoning lots fronting Hillside Avenue. The project area located within a transit zone is well served by public transit, including both subway and bus service. The Jamaica 179th Street subway station with access to the F line is approximately a quarter mile west of the project area. And the area is served by five bus routes uh, that travel alongside Hillside Avenue. Community facility uses in the area include several medical offices, three houses of worship, and two daycare facilities. IS 238 is located on the south side of Hillside Avenue, one block west of the project area, which also provides open space and recreational resources available to the public when school is not in session. Next slide. Uh, project area consists of approximately 80,000 square feet across portions of five tax lots on block 9954. The development site is located on lot 
56, an interior lot consisting of approximately 16,000 square feet and occupied by a vacant single story building. The remaining lots in the project area from west to east include lot one, a corner lot, a frontage on Downey and Hillside Avenue, and improved with a single story bank. Lot 70, improved with a single story laundromat, and on blocks on both sides of the development site are lot 66 and 49, both improved with those seven story residential buildings. Next slide. Uh, looking at the aerial above, looking north into the project area, development site is located in between the two seven-story residential buildings. You can see on the north side of Hillside, uh, you can see the 12-story and seven-story residential buildings located on the adjacent block just to the west, and the lower density buildings on the south side of Hillside Avenue. Next slide, please. Uh, photo one, first on the left, uh, is a view of the western portion of the project area, looking to the one-story bank. Uh, next, uh, excuse me, uh, photo two is a view into the project area from Hillside Avenue, looking to the uh, seven-story building just left of the development site. Next slide, please. Photo three, uh, looking into the development site, sandwiched again by these two seven-story residential buildings. Photo four, looking into the eastern portion of the project area from Hillside Avenue and Chelsea Street. Next slide. And then photo five and six, we're looking across the street from the project area. Photo five, uh, looking southeast into a medical office building. And then photo six, looking directly across from the development site, uh, these two-story uh, ground floor retail, second-story residential buildings. Next slide. In terms of the proposed development, uh, applicant is proposing to build a nine-story, 66,000 square foot mixed-use building, including 48 dwelling units and 4,400 square feet of ground floor commercial space. Of the 48 units, between 12 and 14 of the units would be permanently affordable pursuant to MIH requirements, the applicant intending to pursue option one. 27 parking spaces would be provided, 18 are required, which would be located in the rear yard. 24 bicycle spaces would be provided in the cellar. An applicant is also proposing to provide a terrace on the roof available for residential tenants. Next slide. Uh, above our uh, illustrative drawings of the ground floor plan on the left, uh, typical upper floor plans on the right. Uh, the parking access egress on the left portion of the building, followed by the residential entrance to the right, and then the commercial entrance to the far right. Uh, as proposed, development provide uh, approximately 32 one-bedroom units, 16 two-bedroom units. Next slide. Uh, above is a, a west-east section. Uh, proposed building base rises to a height of 61 feet before an initial 10-foot setback, and then rises to a maximum building height of 91 feet. 95 is permitted. The parking is located within the 79-foot uh, deep, uh, 79 foot deep rear yard, a 30 foot rear yard is required. Next slide. Uh, again, in, uh, in terms of proposed actions, there's a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment. Next slide. First, the applicant proposed a zoning map amendment from R3X and R6A C24 DJ special district to R7A C24 with the underlying uh, special district expanded to the entirety of the project area. Uh, this would allow a maximum residential FAR of 4.6 for inclusionary housing areas and four for community facility uses and reduce the degree of the split lot conditions of the existing lots, which have a smaller R3X footprint as proposed. Accessory off-street parking would be required for 50% of the market rate units and no parking would be required for the affordable units within the transit zone. Uh, Existing C24 commercial overlay designation is unchanged, but is expanded again with along with the R7A and DJ designation. Next slide. Uh, first component of the text amendment is an extension of the existing DJ special district boundary in order to provide a coterminous depth with the proposed zoning district. This provides a depth consistent with the R7A district to the west of the project area and also requires a transition buffer between the lower density districts and the higher density districts along Hillside Avenue. Uh, it limits the maximum height of adjacent buildings located again within 25 feet to 35 feet in height and requires that eight feet of open space. Uh, as previously mentioned, the special downtown Jamaica district has a mechanism for VIH, voluntary inclusionary housing, but not for uh, MIH. To map an MIH area within the special district, uh, the applicant proposes amending the special district provisions to enable MIH within the special district. Next slide. And finally, the applicant proposes to map MIH coterminously with the rezoning area. Uh, the applicant is proposing the map, again, options one and two, but intends to pursue option one, resulting in approximately 12 affordable, uh, uh, permanently affordable units. Option one requires that at least 25% of the residential floor area 
be provided as housing permanently affordable to households with incomes at an average of 60% of the area median income. Within that 25%, at least 10% of the square footage must be used for units affordable to residents with household incomes at an average of 40% of the AMI, with no unit targeted to households with incomes exceeding 130% of the AMI. Next slide. Uh, in conclusion, the, uh, according to the applicant, the proposed rezoning and related text amendment would enable the applicant to bring much needed housing production, including affordable units, to an underutilized site, and that this proposed rezoning would be consistent with the predominant built character of the surrounding area. The applicant also contends that the development is consistent with the objectives of transit-oriented development to locate density, especially mixed-use development, proximate to public transit resources. Uh, concludes the presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Questions. Uh, Scott, could you just refresh my recollection? Uh, at, at what point in the process is an applicant locked into whatever MIH option uh, they choose to pursue? Uh, what is the point of no return in terms of your choice? Uh, if the application is approved, mapping both option one and two, they could pursue either. Um, but they would be locked in with one or the other if it is mapped that way. Approved by, approved by CPC? Uh, well, if it's approved by the city council, ultimately uh, final approval, and city council determines they prefer to map one or the other, they would only be able, uh, I believe, only be able to map, uh, 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 build according to pursuing that option. Yes, that's correct. So at any point prior to uh, the city council's ultimate determination, one could uh, decide to choose option two over option one or option three? Uh, correct. It, 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 the applicant is expressing the preference to intent, uh, proceed with option one. Um, yeah. And yeah. so they are, map, they are proposing uh, in their application mapping both one and two. But it's not as if the applicant would, the only thing that binds the applicant is the city council ultimate vote on it. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marin. I just want to follow up on what Commissioner Knuckles just said. So it is, it is possible that the applicant would like to stick to the lowest AMA possible, which would be option one. And it could be that council could overturn that and go to option two, correct? Correct, sir. Okay, just want to make sure, thank you. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yes, in the same vein, um, I noticed from the briefing sheet that this is proposed to be a 100% affordable project. Um, Scott, what's the- um... This is not an 100% affor affordable. Oh, it's not? Uh, if, if it says so, that's, uh, that's something written by myself and it's an error. Um, okay, uh, yeah, no, it does say 100% of the units are proposed to be affordable. I got excited about it, so I guess I, I should get unexcited. Yeah, so do I. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Rumpershot. Uh, yeah, uh, Scott, uh, you had mentioned that there will be access for the tenants at the roof. Is that correct? Uh, as proposed. As yes. proposed. If they can provide a layout of that, would be great. And, and I know it's illustrative, but I'm looking at the site plan and the parking in the back. I don't know if that works. Are they using valet parking here or? No, they're intending it to be self park. I'm just curious how that's going to work when, you know, on Hillside Avenue, there are a number of people walking along the sidewalk there and cars are coming in and out the way they're showing parking stacked, right? As soon as you get in. So I'm just curious of the flow, the traffic flow within the building there. Um, okay, thank you. I'll ask the applicant to, to uh, explain the navigation on that. No problem, thank you. Other questions? Then the application is certified. Thank, thank you. you, Scott. Thank you. Okay, make sure I'm not muted, okay. Uh, the uh, seventh item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments and special permits in Brooklyn Community District 2. Our presenter is Anthony Grande. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a private application by 130 St. Felix Street, LLC, uh, seeking a zoning map amendment, zoning text amendments, and two special permits to facilitate a new 23-story uh, mixed-use development with approximately 147,000 square feet. Uh, 
The building would have 120 dwelling units, including 36 MIH units. Uh, there would be there would also be about 16,000 square feet of community facility space that the adjacent nonprofit Brooklyn Music School uh, would use to expand its facilities. Next slide. The proposed project is located within the southeastern part of downtown Brooklyn in Community District Two. Next slide. The project site is located uh, just north of the Atlantic Terminal Transit Station, which is at the confluence of Atlantic Avenue, Flatbush Avenue, and 4th Avenue. The site lies within the Special Downtown Brooklyn District, which establishes urban design guidelines and modified bulk regulations to support the continued growth of downtown Brooklyn as the borough's central business district. Uh, the Commission may recall recent rezonings in the area, which are uh, facilitating or have already facilitated several mixed use high rise developments, including the Van South and 80 Flatbush re rezonings uh, west of the project site. The mo and most recently, the 570 Fulton Street rezoning, uh, which lies uh, just about a block to the north. The site is also located within the BAM Historic District which is named for the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Uh, BAM has existed for <clears throat> 150 years as an institution known for avant-garde performing arts and has been located on the same block as the project site since the early 1900s. Uh, the Brooklyn Music School has also been located on the same block since 1921. This nonprofit institution was founded as a music settlement house and now has 6,000 students uh, with 90% receiving free or reduced cost music and perfor performing arts education. These and other nearby arts and uh, culture organizations, such as the Center for Fiction, uh, Mark Morris Dance Center, and the Polanski Shakespeare Center form the heart of the Brooklyn Cultural District, uh, which is, the, which is a, a public initiative in partnership with the Downtown Brooklyn Bid uh, to build on the legacy of places like uh, BAM and the Brooklyn Music School to catalyze development of arts, um, the Arts Center, uh, public spaces, and housing in this area. Next slide. Uh, the project is located on block uh, 2111, which is bounded by Lafayette Avenue to the north, St. Felix Street to the east, Hanson Place to the south, and Ashland Place to the west. The project area covers uh, roughly the southern half of the block and includes four lots. Uh, lot 37 uh, in orange here contains the Brooklyn Music School, which occupies four converted townhomes uh, from the 1860s. Uh, there have been subsequent additions in the rear and the site now has 12,500 square feet of community facility use. Um, next to that, uh, just to the left in magenta, is lot 40, uh, which is the development site. This is a vacant lot that is currently used occasionally for uh, private parking. Uh, then in green, you have lot 7501, where the landmarks 41-story Williamsburg Savings Bank building is located. Um, it totals approximately 325,000 square feet and was originally built as an office building. Um, in, 20, in 2007, uh, much of the space was converted to residential use and is now known as One Hanson Place. Uh, there are nearly 200 residences plus about 50,000 square feet of commercial office and retail. Uh, lot 45 is the remaining lot within the project area, but it is not part of the, of the zoning lot or affiliated with the applicant or proposed development. This lot contains a building that was constructed in 1930 for the uh, Central Methodist Episcopal Church. It also has a street facing ground floor retail space. However, the entire building is currently vacant. Um, the rest of the block is occupied by uh, BAM's flagship uh, Peter J. Sharp building, which fronts on Lafayette Avenue, and then um, the BAM Fisher building, which fronts on Ashland Place. These house a variety of performance venues, practice studios, and, and instructional space. Next slide, please. 
Uh, as you can see in this bird's eye view, there's a wide mix of building types in the surrounding area uh, within downtown Brooklyn, particularly along the Flatbush Avenue corridor. Uh, there are a number of buildings exceeding 30 stories. To the east and the west of the project site, you have the uh, Fort Greene and Borham Hill neighborhoods, which are characterized by three to four story row houses and larger multi-story institutional uses. Next slide, please. Areas to the north and south uh, of the project area are located in the uh, special downtown Brooklyn district and have mid to high density C6 commercial uh, zoning districts. Um, the areas to the east and west of the project area are generally mapped um, with uh, mid density residential districts. Uh, the project area has been zoned C61 since 1961, which allows for up to uh, 3.44 FAR for residential uses on narrow streets and 4 FAR on wide streets. Commercial uses are allowed up to 6 FAR and community facility uses are allowed up to 6.5 FAR. The proposed C64, C64 zoning district would allow up to 12 FAR for residential uses and up to 10 FAR for commercial and community facility uses. The proposed C66 zoning district would allow up to 12 FAR for residential uses uh, pursuant to the applicant's um, proposed text amendment and up to 15 FAR for commercial and community facility. Uh, next slide. Uh, these photos are all taken along St. Felix Street. The first one shows uh, the development site, which, current, uh, which is currently vacant. Um, in photo two, you're looking head on at the Brooklyn Music School. In the third photo, uh, looking south down St. Felix Street, uh, the Brooklyn Music School is on the right. And then the last photo uh, shows the other side of St. Felix, uh, Felix Street, which is um, across from the project area. Next slide. Uh, continuing on, photo uh, five shows the vacant Central Methodist Episcopal Church building. Um, below that in photo eight is what's on the other side of the street uh, from the church. Um, this is the, the Hanson Place frontage of Atlantic Terminal. Photo six uh, in the middle is looking west on Hanson Place with a view that extends across uh, to the buildings on the west side of Flatbush Avenue. Um, in photo seven, looking north on Ashland Place, you can see the, the uh, one Hanson Place building on the right and the plaza outside of the, the BAM South building on the left. Uh, below this in photo nine, you're looking uh, southeast along Ashland Place with the development site in the lower left uh, where the scaffolding is raised and the one Hanson Place building um, just beyond that. Next slide. 130 St. Felix is intended to uh, blend in with its surroundings. As you can see in the diagram, the development site is uh, partially a, a partially through, through block site in between existing structures to the north and to the south. Um, the site has approximately 84 feet of frontage on St. Felix Street and 47 feet of frontage on Ashland Place. Um, on August 4th of last year, the LPC approved issuing a certificate of appropriateness for the proposed design. Uh, the building would have a two-story base that covers the entire lot before uh, stepping back at the third floor, and then a tower portion that remains significantly below the shoulder of uh, one Hanson Place. At the LPC's direction, the bulk of the proposed development has been pushed towards the Ashland Place side and away from St. Felix Street. Uh, this means that uh, much of the proposed development would be flush against the north side of One Hanson Place. 130 St. Felix Street would rise to nearly 250 feet with the tower generally set back uh, 40 feet from St. Felix Street and 16 feet from Ashland Place. The building would total 147,000 square feet uh, with much of this being residential use there would be 120 residential units with 30% of these being uh, permanently income restricted pursuant to the MIH workforce option 
the applicant has stated, the MIH units would be uh, offered at the affordability bands, which are uh, shown on the slide here. This would result in an average affordability at uh, 90, 94% AMI. Uh, the applicants are proposing to develop the MIH units as home ownership units and are seeking an Article 11 tax incentive for these units, making them subject to a regulatory agreement with HPD. Uh, the music school would occupy the basement and the first uh, two floors of the proposed development, which would allow the school to be more physically accessible and allow uh, for an expansion of the program offerings. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a view looking south on St. Felix Street toward the proposed development and the existing uh, Brooklyn Music School building. So you can see the two-story base at 130 St. Felix Street continues the scale of the adjacent buildings that house the Brooklyn Music School. Um, entrances for both uses are located on St. Felix Street with the uh, music school entrance towards the north um, and the residential entrance towards the south part of the St. Felix Street frontage. Next slide, please. Uh, this view looking south along Ashland Place shows the other side of the proposed developments. Uh, the ground level contains service entrances and um, access for uh, one Hanson Place while the Brooklyn Music School is located on the second floor um, and the residential uh, uses are, are located on the floors above, which are set back 16 feet from the street wall. Next slide, please. Uh, to facilitate the proposed development, the applicant is requesting the following actions. Uh, first is a change to the underlying C61 zoning district to the higher density C6 districts. Uh, they're also requesting zoning text amendments to map an MIH area uh, to change the residential FAR allowed uh, within the C66 districts in downtown Brooklyn and to expand uh, the applicability of a bulk special permit that's available within certain zoning districts in downtown Brooklyn. Um, lastly, the applicant is requesting two special permits, one to waive parking and one to allow uh, bulk modifications. So before going through these in more detail, I just wanna take a closer look at the zoning lot um, since uh, the need for some of these actions is due to the zoning lot um, conditions. Um, so next slide. Uh, so currently the development site shares a zoning lot with one Hanson place and under the existing uh, C61 zoning district, this zoning lot is um, significantly overbuilt as uh, demonstrated in the um, table in the upper left. So in conjunction with the proposed developments, the zoning lot will be merged with lot 37, which adds about 8,000 square feet of lot area uh, the zoning lot would have a, a total built FAR of 12.16 with just uh, over 10 FAR of residential use, which is um, demonstrated in the, the lower left table. Next slide, please. So to facilitate the proposed development, the applicant is requesting to change the existing C61 zoning district. Uh, the proposal is to map a C66 on the corner of Ashland Place and Hanson Place and, and noted um, this corner is very prominent due to the open plazas and the broad streets at this location. Um, so this district would be mapped to a depth of 100 feet along Ashland Place and um, the remainder of the project area would be uh, mapped as a C64 uh, zoning district which would um, essentially extend that C64 um, that's mapped across the street to the south. Uh, these districts would permit the same uses and tower bulk regulations that are allowed today, but would allow for higher densities. Uh, the maximum residential FAR would be increased from uh, 4.0 to 12.0. Uh, maximum commercial and community facility FAR would increase from uh, 6 to 6.5 today and a maximum of 10 in the C64 district and 15 in the C66 district. Next slide, please. The applicant is proposing to map a new MIH area 
with option one and the workforce option. MIH option one requires 25% of floor area to be affordable to households at an average of 60% AMI, while the workforce option requires uh, 34 but uh, the 30% of the floor area to be affordable to households at an average of 115% AMI. Uh, the workforce option is only available for 10 years after which uh, new, de new developments would comply only with um, MIH option one. The applicant has stated that they're proposing the workforce option to accommodate the AMIs uh, needed for the home ownership program. Uh, next slide. The applicant is also uh, proposing text amendments to two sections of the special downtown Brooklyn district zoning text. Uh, first, the applicant is proposing to amend section uh, 101.21D of the zoning resolution, which limited, what limits residential use in uh, C66 districts to an FAR of nine uh, when located in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant is proposing an amendment that will allow 12 FAR in new C66 districts when MIH is mapped. Um, this would be consistent with the residential FAR allowed in this district outside of downtown Brooklyn. Uh, also, the applicant is proposing to amend section 101-82 of the zoning resolution, which is a downtown Brooklyn special permit that allows uh, bulk waivers on irregular sites uh, within C69 zoning districts. The applicant is proposing an amendment that would allow this permit to also be used um, where C64 and C66 zoning, uh, zoning districts are mapped. Next slide. Uh, with this expanded eligibility, the applicant is also requesting uh, bulk waivers under this special permit to modify yard, court, and uh, tower lot coverage regulations due to the development site's um, irregular shape and conditions. So to grant this special permit, the CPC must find that there are irregular site conditions that create difficulties with compliance, that these difficulties are not self-created, and that uh, the relief granted is the minimum necessary and does not adversely affect the surrounding area. Um, this this uh, may look familiar. Um, the commission will recall the special permit was recently uh, created and used as part of the 570 Fulton Street rezoning. Next slide, please. Uh, the first waiver is for uh, portions of the building that lie within the required uh, rear yard equivalent. So um, at and above uh, floors with residential use, a 40 foot yard is required along St. Felix Street and a 20 foot yard is required along Ashland Place. So in the proposed developments, um, this starts at the third floor where the permitted, permitted envelope um, extends 22 feet into the required yard along, uh, along St. Felix Street and extends across the entire 20 foot yard along Ashland Place. Then above the third story, uh, the envelope sets back and the entire uh, a uh, 40 foot yard is provided along St. Felix Street, um, whereas along Ashland Place, the envelope extends uh, four feet into the required 20 foot yard on all the um, all those upper floors. Next slide, please. Um, the second uh, the second bulk waiver requested is for a small inner court that would not meet the required uh, minimum area or dimensions. This court would be created by a small recess on the north wall of one Hanson place, uh, which is highlighted in the blue uh, in the image on the left. The proposed development would be built flush against the north wall of one Hanson place, except um, for this recess. So zoning requires small inner courts uh, such as this to have a minimum area of 200 square feet and dimension of at least 10 feet. The resulting court would have an area of 75 uh, square feet and a, a minimum dimension of 2.4 feet. Next slide. The applicant is also requesting a bulk waiver for tower lot coverage uh, when residential uses are located above 150 feet. Zoning allows a maximum lot coverage of uh, 40%. 
at and above this height. So of the approximately 40,000 um, square foot zoning lots, the existing building on lot 7501 covers approximately 38% of the zoning lots at 150 feet. Um, so with the proposed development, the lot coverage above 150 feet would, would increase to 54%. Uh, next slide, please. Lastly, the applicant is seeking a special permit pursuant to uh, section 74.533 of the ZR to waive the 17 residential parking spaces that would be required by zoning. Uh, this special permit allows for a development located within the transit zone where at least 20% of the units are income restricted, such as through MIH, to request a reduction or a waiver in the residential parking. The commission may permit this reduction or waiver in parking if it finds that doing so would facilitate the developments and would not have adverse effects on the surrounding uses, traffic, and uh, parking availability. The applicant's responses to these special permits can be found uh, in the briefing package. Um, that's the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry about that. I have to demask and I'll start with Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Anthony, for the presentation. I'm just curious, is the central uh, Episcopal Church building a landmark? Uh, it's not a landmark, um, but the area here is part of a historic district. And so um, any, any changes there would be uh, would require an LPC approval. So it's tantamount to being a landmark. Yeah, I guess that, that's true. Um, so does anyone know the fate of, of, of that building uh, at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, to, for, uh, as far as we know, you know, this, the, the development team hasn't, you know, worked with the owners there and they're not affiliated with this development. So um, yeah, we don't, we don't know. It wasn't projected to develop as part of this um, just because right. of the, you know, the LPC condition. Yeah. And, and I could, I could add to that too. We know, we know the building itself is in not great shape. Um, it's, it's a very large building has multiple floors below grade. Um, but uh, as, as Anthony mentioned, it, it wasn't projected uh, partly because um, the lot line conditions with, with the Williamsburg Savings Bank uh, the windows there and the fact that LPC would have to review any development there, um, including demolition. Um, and so uh, that, that's part of their review process. Thank you. Commissioner Levin. Thank you. This is, a, you know, this is another uh, typically intricate, complicated um, application with lots of moving pieces to it. Um, and um, I understand that at least at the LPC review, there are quite a few people in the neighborhood who weren't happy to see um, this take place. And I imagine some of those issues will come back before us. So I'll wait until we get deeper into the public review discussion to deal with those questions. But just one factual thing, the um, windows in one Hanson place that will be essentially blocked up by the waiver of the court. Um, I think the briefing sheet indicates those are not legally required windows, but that doesn't really assuage the folks who are on the other side of those windows. Do we know what use is um, in fact in the apartment? Is it, I know that's a mixed building, mixed office and residential. Um, what, what's being, what's behind those windows that are being covered up by that waiver? Yeah, um, right. So they're not legally required. Uh, I, I'll get back to you on that. I think we can we can check with the applicant, but I think um, those are uh, those windows are in circulation spaces. Um, I don't know if they're even um, windows to units, but I can't say that for sure. So we'll get back to you. Okay. If I may, uh, Anthony is correct. They are windows to circulation spaces. That was one of our questions when the building was being proposed and modified in terms of its shape and the waiver sought, but we can get more information about that to the commission. At okay, the so circulation space in the sense that those are common areas and not in people's apartments? Uh, that's right, they are okay. parts of the emergency stairs. Ah, okay, okay. 
So not even regularly used publicly. That's correct. I mean, by folks in the building. Yes. Okay, thank you. More to come, I'm sure. Thank you, Anthony. Did, did you say that the LPC has already reviewed and approved the design that we're seeing today? Yes. And they had a public hearing, I assume? Uh, yes. And, and do we know the testimony from that hearing or any, is that in the package? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm just yeah, curious I'm... to know what sort of went down at the at the LPC, because <laughs> obviously it's a, one would imagine a pretty controversial development. Yeah, you can Google that one. There are a couple of big fat articles about it. Oh, okay. I will do that. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I don't have direct knowledge of it. I, I assume there was a public hearing, but... <laughs> well, Google has all we need, probably. <laughs> yeah. It also comes back, reach out to the LPC and see what records it is that they have as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one thing I just, I, you know, back to the windows for a second. So if, if they're not required for light and air and they actually are in a stairwell, would it be more prudent for the applicant to seal them so that, you know, cleaning them is not going to be an issue? The space between the building is not an issue. I mean, I think it, in my mind's eye, it's more prudent to put a seismic joint there and seal that space than to have it collect dirt, rain, snow. I mean, we all know what water and, and can do to a building and it'll, it'll creep in the most obnoxious of places. And when you have these two buildings joined together, that could also create some water infiltration at the end of the day. And again, if they're not being used and if they're in, 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 in areas that they can be sealed, and again, a seismic joint so that the building looks contiguous, I think that would be a benefit. Yeah, I think, uh... At least as far as the uh, waiver goes um, for creating that small court, um, you know, the applicant described sort of the difficulty in obviously designing the building to sort of fill that space in terms of efficiency of the design. Um, but I think, you know, we can we can ask them to, to clarify, you know, the, the situation with the windows and and um, whether they can do something about that. I would, I would think that from a design and construction standpoint, getting, getting it up against the building is easier than leaving that small of a gap between buildings. That's what the applicant Thank you, Anthony. Okay, thanks. I'll also note that I was there last evening at around 6.30 in the afternoon. I was just so heartened to see the amount of street light uh, street life that was returning, the vibrancy of the open restaurants, and the apple store always being a draw. Other questions? Okay, this application is certified. The eighth item on our agenda is a certification of a site selection and acquisition and city map amendments in Brooklyn Community District 6. Our presenter is Jenna Rogoff. Great, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. So the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, the Department of Sanitation, DSNY, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, are requesting a joint site selection and acquisition of real property by the city, a standalone site selection action, and two city map amendments to support combined sewer overflow or CSO infrastructure in the Gowanus neighborhood of Brooklyn within Community District 6. In particular, the actions would facilitate the construction of a 4 million gallon CSO tank known as the Owl's Head facility and the on-site relocation of an existing DSNY salt shed and snowplow storage area. Additionally, as an action related to a previously approved site selection and acquisition, the applicants also seek a city, a city map amendment to support the construction of a nearby head end CSO facility located further north along the Gowanus Canal. Next slide, please. The Owl's Head project site outlined and shaded in red is situated along the eastern side of the Gowanus Canal in the southern portion of the neighborhood within the Brooklyn, the, excuse me, the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone or IBZ, shown in a pink outline. Across from the canal to the north is the area covered by the Gowanus Neighborhood Plan, where the department in collaboration with other city agencies, elected officials, and community members is currently proposing approximately 80 block area-wide plan with a series of land use actions to support a vibrant, mixed-use, sustainable, and resilient neighborhood. About a half a mile to the north of the site 
located at the head end of the canal is DEP's Gowanus Wastewater Pumping Station, an existing facility that is part of the wastewater conveyance and treatment system that connects to the Red Hook Wastewater Treatment Plant. And then adjacent to the pumping station is the location of a proposed head end CSO facility shown in a dashed white line and in the rendering to the right, which was subject to a site selection acquisition application approved in 2018 and which is expected to start construction later this year. Within the head end site, I just wanna point out a portion of Douglas Street shown uh, shaded in red, which remains a mapped but unbuilt street, city street. Next slide, please. For background, both the previously approved head end facility and the proposed owl's head facility would be developed to meet a federal requirement to reduce the volume of combined sewer overflows entering the Gowanus Canal. In 2010, the canal was designated a federal Superfund site to facilitate the remediation of hazardous sediments that were deposited into the canal over the area's long industrial history. In 2013, the US Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, issued a record of decision requiring the reduction of sewage overflows into the canal. And then in 2014, the EPA issued, uh, issued a unilateral administrative order for remedial design ordering construction of CSO reduction facilities near two sewer outfall locations along the canal, and then establishing milestones for the city to implement those facilities. To meet this requirement, DEP undertook a siting and planning study to determine appropriate locations for potential facilities along the canal. Based on conceptual facility design for the required 4 million gallon CSO storage tank, DEP considered potential locations near a sewer outfall in the canal's middle portion, evaluating a range of screening criteria that included engineering, environmental land use, construction, and cost considerations. Then based on that analysis, DEP identified the proposed project site location due to its cost effectiveness and requiring a shorter, less complex conveyance infrastructure to connect to the outfall. In addition to these two facilities, DEP has also undertaken a number of infrastructure upgrades within the neighborhood to reduce CSO discharge to the canal and further improve its water quality. These upgrades include uh, improvements to the pumping station and the uh, historic flushing tunnel, green infrastructure, and the, more recently the construction and installation of high level storm sewers in the local watershed area, which is anticipated to further reduce the frequency and volume of CSO into the canal as well as reduce street flooding. Next slide, please. The surrounding area contains primarily commercial and industrial uses consisting of vehicle storage and repair, building and supply businesses, distribution and warehousing, and specialized manufacturing. The project site in much of the surrounding area is mapped as an M21 zoning district, which extends along both sides of the canal and permits heavy industrial uses with a maximum FAR of two uh, for both industrial and commercial use. Next slide. And then zooming in, uh, this is a bird's eye view of the site and its context. You can see an office building directly southeast of the site that contains a state operated parole facility. Northwest of the site by Third Street and the Fourth Street Turning Basin is a new Whole Foods supermarket while the area is primarily industrial, a few larger warehouse style buildings have been repurposed into offices, bars and restaurants, art, artist workspaces, and smaller scale manufacturing. The project site itself totals 4.1 acres on a waterfront block bounded by the canal, the Sixth Street Turning Basin, and Second Avenue, a two-way 80-foot wide street. The site encompasses five tax lots, including a city-owned property, on block 997 lot three, which is under the jurisdiction of DSNY and has been used since 2008 for the storage of rolled salt and snow plow equipment. This property is also periodically used by the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, a local nonprofit organization for the purposes of composting activities, environmental education, and other types of stewardship events. The remaining four lots within the project site are privately owned consisting of a portion of 5th Street on block 997 lot 1, which is a map city street used for private purposes. To the south on block 
990. Lot 21 is used as an open uh, vehicle storage and then lots one and 16 each contain one story buildings used by automobile, automobile repair and shipping businesses respectively. Next slide. And just a few photos for context. This is a view looking west from 2nd Avenue showing this, the city owned lot used by DSMY as storage for road salt and snow plows. Next slide. This is a view of the portion of 5th Street that, that is a privately used map city street looking west from 2nd Avenue. Next slide. This is a view of the interior portion of 5th Street looking east towards 2nd Avenue with the auto repair, automobile repair and shipping businesses on lot one to the right and then the state parole facility further in the background. Next slide. And lastly, another view of lot one looking southwest along 2nd Avenue with the elevated subway viaduct further in the background. Next slide. So the proposed project would include the Owl's Head CSO facility, the on-site relocation of an existing DSNY storage area, and as well as other construction staging areas. The CSO facility highlighted in red would consist of a below grade structure containing a 4 million gallon tank and an approximately 17,600 square foot two story above grade structure depicted uh, in darker shade of, of red that would house the facility's screening equipment, electrical equipment, and an odor control system. Flow from the facility would be conveyed to the Owl's Head Interceptor through an existing regulator located at the intersection of 3rd Avenue and 7th Street. A new force main would be constructed to connect the Owl's Head facility to the interceptor for delivery of flow uh, to the Owl's Head wastewater treatment plant once there is sufficient downstream capacity within the sewer system. A specific routing of the sewer system flows to the facility would be determined further during design in order to direct the flow to the new facility an existing regulator located just north of 2nd Avenue and 5th Street would be replaced and other existing infrastructure, including uh, a brick chamber and sewer outfit would be decommissioned. Meanwhile, a new pumping station with a 1 million gallon per day capacity would be constructed within the facility along with a new outfall. The remainder of the site highlighted in yellow is intended to encompass the new DSNY facility an additional space for maintenance and operations with landscaping where appropriate, as well as areas for environmental education programs and composting activities. The applicants are also evaluating the potential to include publicly accessible waterfront open space where it does not interfere or conflict with the operation of the CSO control facility or the DSNY space. In an effort to comply with the recent EPA order with strict deadlines for DEP to start design and construction. At this time, a more detailed design and layout for the facilities has not yet been developed. That being said, uh, the applicants do intend to advance components of the design over the next few months as they engage with the EPA. And then similar to the previously approved CSO facility at the Canal's Head End, the site's design will be developed further as part of the Public Design Commission or PDC review process. Next slide. To facilitate the proposed project, the applicants are seeking the approval of four land use actions. First, a site selection and acquisition in order to acquire the four privately owned lots, which are needed in connection with the facilities and space for construction staging. Second, a standalone city, uh, standalone site selection action to support the construction of the CSO facility on the city owned lot currently used DSNY. Third, a city map amendment to, to demap a portion of 5th Street in order to better utilize available space on the site. Fourth, in addition to the actions related to the Owl's Head facility, the applicants also seek a city map amendment to demap an unbuilt portion of Douglas Street in connection with the development of the Head End City CSO facility. And this is really intended as a cleanup action related to the previously approved site selection and acquisition from 2018. Next slide. 
To help illustrate the proposed actions, the joint site selection and acquisition would cover the privately owned lots on block 997 lot one, as well as block 990 lots 1, 16, and 21. Since the city owned lot on block 997 lot three does not need to be acquired by the city, the applicants are only seeking a standalone site selection for this lot. Next slide. And just to illustrate the proposed city map amendment uh, for the fifth street uh, as part of the Owls Head facility, the applicant seeks to demap the portion of fifth street between second Avenue and the Gowans Canal. Next slide. And then as a cleanup action associated with the head end facility, the applicants seek a city map amendment for Douglas Street between Nevin Street and the canal. And I also just wanna quickly point out that uh, this entire lot has been acquired by the city. Next slide. A notice of completion of a final environmental impact statement FEIS which analyzed both the, the Owl's Head and Head End facilities was issued by DEP as the lead agency on February 1st, 2018. A tech memo to the FEIS was issued, uh, which identified potential, uh, a single potential significant adverse impact with respect to historic and cultural resources and no other uh, in significant adverse impacts were identified. Next slide. Before concluding, department staff just want to note quickly that while the applicants intend to further flesh out the design layout for the Owl's Head facility, these actions would facilitate really critical sewer infrastructure improvements that complement the goals of a clean canal and an environmentally sustainable neighborhood, which tie into both the Gowanus neighborhood plan, but also ongoing efforts to craft a vision for the IBZ portion of Gowanus. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, just to ask um, Jonah, what's the time frame for development of this, assuming all the approvals get in place? It's gonna take a long time to build, right? It will. So DEP is currently working with EPA to finalize that, but according to EPA's order, they're looking to develop the site in 2028. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, as compared to the prior complex project, pretty straightforward and the application is certified. Thanks. Okay, um, moving on to our uh, the ninth item on our agenda, which is a certification of a zoning map amendment in the Bronx Community District 1. Our presenter is Fernando Ortiz. Good afternoon, Chair Lego and Commissioners. Um, my name is Fernando Ortiz from the Bronx office, and I'm here to talk today about 624 Morris Avenue rezoning. Next slide, please. Um, the applicant for this project is 624 Morris B LLC, and the site is located at 624 Morris Avenue within the Melrose neighborhood and community district one. Um, the actions requested for uh, this project is a zoning map amendment from an R71 to an R71 C14 overlay. Next slide, please. Um, as noted, this project is located within the Melrose neighborhood in the South Bronx near the Grand Concourse and 149th Street. Um, next slide, please. The proposed rezoning area shown in red includes seven continuous lots. The site is located uh, two blocks north of 149th Street, which is a major transit and commercial corridor and also um, near uh, uh, Lincoln Hospital on 149th Street. It is two blocks south of a NYCHA campus. It is directly west of the Alfred uh, Smith Educational Campus, which has three uh, schools within, it, within the campus. And it is one block east of Park Avenue. Um, also, it is about four blocks south of the Melrose um, Station for the Metro North. 
All of the lots have frontage on Morris Avenue, which is a busy commercial corridor. Um, the area is mixed in use with mostly residential and commercial uses and some large com uh, community facilities such as uh, Lincoln Hospital. Next slide, please. Um, the project, uh, the existing zoning for this area is an R71. Um, the applicant seeks to add a C14 commercial overlay on this block. Um, as can be noted, uh, commercial overlays exist directly across the street from the site, as well as north and south of the site along Morris Avenue. Next slide, please. Um, as previously mentioned, uh, the area that is looking to be rezoned is outlined in the black dotted lines and 624 Morris Avenue is the area shown in the red outline. Um, the site is currently in R71, the rezoning area um, I'm sorry, the existing lots on in within the rezoning area are currently legal non conforming uses. Um, these uses have existed in the neighborhood for decades, with 624 Morris Avenue um, having a commercial use on the ground floor since at, since at least 1973. So this rezoning will be uh, will support uh, small businesses during this pandemic recovery. Next slide. please. Um, I'm sorry, can you go to the previous slide? I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, I just wanted to note that um, when the current uh, zoning resolution went into effect in 1961, the area was zoned as R6 with a C14 overlay. That was changed to R71 with a C14 in 1970 and then to R71 without the commercial overlay in 1973. Although the buildings in the project area all had ground floor commercial uses at that time, the C14 overlays remained on the back on the block front facing the project area on the west side of Morris Avenue, and on the block front immediately south of the project area. After the C14 overlay was removed in 1973, the existing commercial uses remained as legal non-conforming uses but the commercial uses could not be expanded or extended to, uh, to other parts of the building in which they were located. Um, 624 Morris Avenue, which as I mentioned is shown in red, expanded the commercial use of its ground floor to a pre-existing shopkeeper living, uh, living quarters that was located at the rear of the ground floor. This was done without an alteration permit from the Department of Buildings, which resulted in a violation being issued to 624 Morris Avenue. Um, the current owner of this site acquired the property in 2015. Next slide, please. Um, 624 Morris Avenue, shown here in red, um, seeks to allow for its ground floor commercial use to become a legally conforming use, as well as that of its neighboring lots on the block. 624 Morris Avenue is a four-story building with the upper three floors being residential with one dwelling unit per floor. Um, it is worth noting that the corner lot here shown on the uh, right, uh, 618 Morris Avenue uh, was uh, developed in 2014, uh, which received a BSA approval to allow this lot to be used for commercial use, and it is currently vacant. Um, next slide, please. Um, within this slide here, you can see in the first image on the top left, you can see the site directly from across the street on Morris Avenue. Um, on the bottom left, you can see the site looking north from Morris Avenue and 151st Street. And on the bottom right, you can see Morris Avenue looking south towards 149th Street. What is worth noting um, from these images as, is that Morris Avenue is a busy commercial corridor um, and a very transited street. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, the proposed action consists of a zoning map amendment to zoning sectional map 6A, which would extend a C14 commercial overlay within part of the existing R71 district. Um, this would enable existing commercial uses to become legal conforming uses. Um, and so in essence, what the rezoning is hoping to do is to allow these commercial uses to become uh, conforming. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Questions from the commission. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Ortiz, for your uh, presentation. I just want to clarify 
uh, one thing that I read in the text under the uh, heading of description of the proposed development. There's a paragraph there that you've uh, that you've alluded to uh, relating to the history of the site uh, and the uh, ground for commercial use going back to 73. And then in the last sentence, it says the work was performed without an alteration permit from the uh, from DOB and a violation was recorded against the property. As such, the commercial use is currently conforming. And then sorry, that should be that should be non typo, right? Not yes, conforming. Exactly. Okay. That's correct. I See, do read these things from time to time. Thank you. Yes, that was that, that should say non-conforming. Um, the violation <clears throat> was issued in 1999. Okay. Long time ago. Not just read them, read them with an eagle eye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for highlighting that. Um, any other questions? Okay, then this is our final certification of the afternoon. The application is certified. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, the tenth item on our agenda uh, is a pre-hearing review of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 4, and Nabila Malik will present. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, this is a private application by 311 West 42nd Street Associates, LLC, requesting a special permit to modify height. This is to allow a portion of the proposed building along West 43rd Street to rise to a height of approximately 89 feet at 314 West 43rd Street. The proposal would facilitate a 295,000 square foot mixed use building on a through block site located within the Special Clinton District and Special Midtown District in Clinton Hell's Kitchen, Community District 4, Manhattan. This project was referred out on February 1st. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see the site outlined in red straddles the Clinton Hell's Kitchen and Midtown neighborhoods um, and the special Clinton and Midtown districts. Most of the surrounding area is zoned commercial with C62 to the north and C64 to the south. To the west of the site is the more residential area of Clinton and to the east of the site is the more commercial area of Midtown. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you through a breakdown of the project site. Lot 25 highlighted in blue is improved with an existing 13 story 62,000 square foot commercial building that was constructed in 1970. And you may recall this was the um, SEIU 1199 SEIU building, which has been relocated. Next slide, please. Um, so lot 41 currently contains a surface parking lot with stackers with a total license capacity of 102 spaces. Lots 25 and 41 would be consolidated for the development of the proposed new building. Next slide. Uh, lot 22 is improved with a five-story tenement building constructed in 1920 and containing commercial use on the ground floor and 14 residential units above and will be preserved as part of the proposal. The proposed development will be using development rights from lot 22. Next slide, please. Um, so because the development site involves multiple zoning districts and special districts within different sub areas, I've broken the site down into lot portions to describe applicable regulations. So the portion of the development site beyond 150 feet of 8th Avenue along 43rd Street is within a C62 district in the preservation area of the Special Clinton District. The preservation area restricts the height of a building or portion of a building to no more than seven stories or 66 feet if located beyond 100 feet from a wide street. So the special permit would modify this regulation. The special district regulations permit a maximum of 4.2 FAR in the preservation area. And the sub area also requires that a minimum of 20% of the lot area must be usable landscaped open area for residents. Next slide, please. Um, the portion of the development site beyond 150 feet of 8th Avenue along 42nd Street is within a C64 district in the perimeter area B and 
the 42nd Street perimeter area sub area one of the Special Clinton District. This portion is not subject to the special permit and would be developed pursuant to the existing zoning regulations. Next slide, please. So the portion of the development site within 150 feet of 8th Avenue is located within a C64 district in the 8th Avenue perimeter area of the special district of the special Clinton district and also within the theater subdistrict 8th Avenue corridor of the special Midtown district. The maximum FAR allowed in this portion is 12 pursuant to the special Midtown district regulations. This portion is also not subject to the special permit waiver and would be developed pursuant to the existing zoning regulations. Next slide, please. So the proposed development consists of a mixed use building located on lots 25 and 41. In total, the proposed development will contain 295,000 square feet of floor area, including approximately 21,000 square feet of unused development rights from lot 22. The proposed development would contain 25,000 square feet of commercial use and about 270,000 square feet of residential use with 321 residential units, 81 of which will be affordable. Um, the development would also contain uh, two buildings, would consist of two building segments separated by a rear yard equivalent with a minimum depth of 60 feet in the form of a landscaped garden, which would provide the required open space. The garden will be available for use by all residential tenants. Next slide, please. The southern portion of the proposed development is not subject to the special permit waiver and will be constructed pursuant to the current zoning regulations. It will have approximately 31 stories and as currently proposed, the illustrative building will rise to um, a height of 395, 399 feet with bulkhead. Um, and the tower will have a lot coverage of 23% of the entire development site. The southern building segment would contain approximately 244 residential units, 49 of which would be affordable to households with incomes ranging between 40 to 120% AMI. The ground floor and second floor of the southern portion of the building will contain retail uses and the building is also expected to contain additional amenity spaces on the second, fourth, and 31st stories. No changes are proposed for the lot 22 portion of the zoning lot. Next slide, please. The portion of the northern building segment within lot portion A would contain a total of 63,000 square feet with 54,000 square feet of residential use and 9,000 square feet of retail use. The northern building segment would contain approximately 77 residential units, approximately 32 of which would be affordable to households with incomes ranging between 40 to 120 percent AMI. The portion of the northern building segment within lot portion A, which is the subject of the requested special permit, would contain seven stories and rise to a maximum height of 89 feet. The easternmost 25 feet of the northern building segment, which is lot portion C, is not subject to the requested modification and would rise to a maximum height of 66 feet consistent with applicable zoning controls. This element would serve as a residential entry to the proposed development. The ground floor of the northern building segment would also contain retail use with two entrances proposed along 43rd Street. A curb cut for vehicular access to a commercial loading dock would be located along 43rd Street at the western end of the development site. Next slide, please. So the applicant seeks a special permit pursuant to the special Clinton district preservation area regulations that allow the commission to modify height and setback requirements. The maximum height in the preservation area beyond 100 feet of a wide street is 66 feet and can be modified to a maximum of 99 feet. The applicant is proposing a height of 89 feet, as you can see in the section here in the dark um, gray shaded area. Next slide, please. 
The applicant has noted that it has met the findings for this proposal as the heights being proposed for the northern building segment are reflective of the varying heights of buildings along 43rd Street within the Special Clinton Preservation Area. Along the north side of 43rd Street, building heights range from 10 to 208 feet, and along the south side of 43rd Street, building heights range from 44 to 99 feet. Next slide, please. Manhattan Community Board 4 held a hearing on the application on February 10th, and at its March 3rd full board meeting, the board voted to recommend approval of the application, but outlined several conditions, including a redesign of the recessed entrance of the proposed building on 43rd Street. The board also noted that the applicant work on an art installation to commemorate 1199 SEIU's history at the site, and that they present their affordable housing plan to its Housing, Health, and Human Services Committee. The borough president recommended to approve this proposal with conditions related to the affordable housing plan, the design of the recessed entrance area, and a commemoration piece tied to the history of the site. Next slide, please. So in summary, the applicant is requesting a special permit to modify the special district height regulations to allow a portion of the proposed building along 43rd Street to rise to a maximum height of 89 feet at 314 West 43rd Street. The proposal would facilitate an approximately 295,000 square foot mixed use building. Thank you. Thank you, Nabila. And now we turn it over for questions from the commission. Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, thank you, Nabila. The, um, both the community board's recommendation and the borough president cite some concerns, of, I guess the recess, the, some concerns about the residential recess, um, pointing out that this, this particular location has unfortunately seen a spike in unsavory street activity and, and some real experience they've got with drug dealing and other nasty stuff going on. And um, so there's been back and forth between the community board, the borough president and the applicant and that letter, the applicant's response to the community board um, which was in our packet expresses some sympathy with the community board's position, but apparently indicates they've consulted with city planning and that there's not much that can be done to eliminate this recess. Can you tell us what the technical issue is about that recess? Sure, so, so this actually has to do with the special Midtown district regulations that require um, pedestrian circulation space, um, which involves, um, you know, adding recesses to to building entrances, and that's that's sort of that's why that area is recessed to begin with. Um, and as you as you saw in the letter, um, you know, the applicant is working with CB4 to um, modify design elements to to activate the space. Um, but yes, yeah, so that so it's a requirement in the special midtown district regulations. Okay, so for this particular site, it's really an unintended consequence, um, not anything that we would have designed from scratch, but they're kind of stuck with it. Okay, thank you very much. I figured it was something like that. You're welcome. Commissioner Bernie. Um, yeah, I mean, just to follow up on that, I mean, if this is a self inflicted wound and we don't want a recess, why can't we pursue into this? Um, approval, change it. So um, because it's in the special midtown district regulations, those would have to be modified as part of the application, which would mean sort of revisiting the entire um, application itself. Um, you, can't, you can't do it just for this, this particular location then? It wasn't in the application. Had the applicant picked up on it and asked for it, I have to think that we would be amenable to it for the reasons that Commissioner Levin points out that this particular block has a, a challenging street presence, but I, I believe that technically it's not within scope. They didn't ask for the waiver of these special midtown provisions. But they could be persuaded to ask, no? In a new ULERP. It Correct. can't be added to this one? It's not within the scope of this one. It's not what the public was told about. It's not what the public commented on. It, it's th this is truly unfortunate. 
Oh, so it's already too far down the pipe to change. I, I get it. Okay. Correct. Right. It would have to be an entirely new proposal at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so having said that, I mean, I'm assuming from a security perspective, there are things they could do with cameras or whatever that, to satisfy the concern. Yeah. Yeah, so they've they've noted, um, you know, design elements like lighting and sort of rearranging the planters from their sort of original design, which um, I can make sure that they have more details on um, for Wednesday's hearing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Okay, then we'll see this at the public hearing on Wednesday will be the um, actually only public hearing that we will be holding on Wednesday. Thanks, Nabila. So the 11th item on our agenda is a city council modification scope determination uh, for the citywide zoning for coastal flood resiliency zoning text amendment. And here to discuss the changes is uh, Manuela Parideco. Thank you and good afternoon, commissioners. This will be a very quick update, uh, but zoning for coastal flood resiliency was presented uh, to the city council zoning subcommittee on April 5th. The subcommittee voted to approve the citywide tax with modifications on April 20th. And the accompanying three local actions in Brooklyn and Queens were approved without modifications. The land use committee then approved such motion on April 27th uh, and the full council will vote on next Wednesday. May 12. So the city council modifications for the citywide text are really small and mainly touch upon adding clarifications in two main areas of the text. The first one was to better clarify the applicability of Article 6, Chapter 4, so the special regulations applying flood zones, which include regulations that address the bulk of buildings in the floodplain. This was really to ensure that the text sections clearly describe that the rules are only applicable to zoning lots within the floodplain and not beyond that. Uh, the second was just to add clarifications within sections that address floor area calculations and permitted obstruction regulations that govern the size and placement of accessory power system and other mechanical equipment to ensure that the text uh, really is clearly stating that only accessory equipment is allowed in open areas and that the area that can be deducted from floor area is only the area occupied by the equipment plus minimum, the minimum necessary that is needed to provide uh, for access into the space and area for equipment maintenance. So those were the kind of main clarifications we, we handled. Um, and then aside from those, there were other smaller items, uh, many of which include adding cross references into other sections in the zoning resolution and other editorial changes to improve the overall readability of the text. And I would say that we work closely with city council and use on these modifications and believe that they are within the project scope and do not require additional review of environmental issues. So yeah, let me know if you have any questions about those. It was a daunting packet given its size, but the reality is that the changes were as, as minor as can be, and um, the department certainly is pleased to make them. Any questions from the commission? Then I will just ask um, for approval to send a letter to the council letting them know that these changes are within scope. If folks can raise it. Yes. Approved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thanks, Manuela. Uh, moving on for Wednesday, May 5th, 2021, staff have prepared reports for the following, uh, the Melrose Open Door, uh, the Crab Shanty Restaurant, uh, 361 City Island Avenue, 909 Castle Hill Avenue, West 16th Street Special Permit, the Bedford Stuyvesant Central and North of UDAP and Dispo. And then also scheduled for decision on Wednesday is uh, 325 Woodvale Avenue, a uh, South Richmond certification. Okay. So for post-hearing follow-ups, uh, I believe we have St. Joseph's. This is uh, 1949 Bathgate Avenue, if there's any 
further questions you'd like for us to take back? Okay. The Crescent Beach Park expansion. Again, nope, okay. Uh, 1427 Ralph Avenue, this is the site selection. Um, okay. And 42 Walker Street. All right. That is the end of our agenda. Commissioners, for a um, lengthy meeting, as I mentioned, we will have one public hearing on Wednesday and one update presentation on the Queens Garage that is part of the BBJ initiative. And so I look forward to seeing you then. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.